We ready to proceed? Okay. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to this online hearing of the Committee of Adjustment for the City of Ottawa. The Committee of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial tribunal appointed by City Council to make decisions on certain types of applications under the Planning Act. My name is John Blatherwick and I will be chairing this hearing today. With me are my fellow panel members, Heather McLean and Michael Wildman. Please take note that this video conference is being live streamed on YouTube. The video will be archived along with today's agenda on the city's website. Before we begin, we have a few items to outline for your information. While the issues surrounding development in the city are broad, our mandate is quite limited. The committee cannot consider aspects of the proposal that are not related to the required variances. Noise, pollution, property maintenance, property values, prosecution for illegal construction, personal comments regarding neighbors, agents, or applicants, additional variances without proper public notice. If there is an identified need for an additional variance or variances, including an increase in the extent of the relief required, a recirculation of the application is required. As part of the statutory public notification requirements, each applicant was required to post a sign on the property and file a statutory declaration confirming the sign posting. Uh, we don't have any stat decks, so I'm going to have to administer the oath to the agent or applicant before each of the matters we'll be dealing with today. Regarding quorum, if this is lost during the hearing due to technical difficulties, the proceedings will be paused to allow time for the resolution of the issue. Failing the ability to reinstate quorum, hearing of the items remaining will resume at the outset of the next regularly scheduled meeting of the committee. In terms of the hearing process, Listed on the agenda and appearing on the screen are the applications we will hear today. For the sake of efficiency, the committee may deal with agenda items in a different order. Note that the committee members have reviewed the application materials prior to this hearing and any written submissions received in support or in opposition. In addition, the committee will hear today oral submissions from any interested parties as part of our proceedings. The committee may ask for a brief presentation by the applicant followed by questions from the members where clarification may be needed. The public submissions portion of the hearing will then begin and any interested parties will be invited to make their submissions to the committee. Panel members may then ask follow-up questions where added clarification may be required. When you are called to upon to provide your comments, we will ask you to do the following. Start with stating your name and municipal address for the record. We may ask you to spell your name. Then begin your submission by addressing your comments to the panel members. You may ask questions, but please direct them only to the chair. Please limit your comments to a maximum of five minutes. Any exceptions will be at the committee's discretion. Once all interested parties have had an opportunity to address the panel, the public submissions portion of the hearing will then be closed. The committee will then make an oral decision to either grant or deny the application. The committee may also choose to reserve its decision. In such case, the panel will deliberate further on the evidence presented immediately following adjournment of the public hearing. In either case, the committee will send within 10 days of its decision and to all parties and those who have requested it, a written decision that sets out the reasons for the decision. All decisions of the committee are subject to a 20-day appeal period during which the decision can be appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal for a fee. So before we begin, are there any declarations of interest to any of the panel members regarding items on this agenda or panel two or panel three? I have, uh, I have a conflict regarding Item number, item numbers four and five, on the uh, on the application four eighty six Wentworth Avenue, as I always have when an application comes before me um, for my neighborhood, I recuse myself from the application. This is also a property that directly behind and immediately to the left of my home, and I have been in discussions with the applicant and and neighbors on this application. So I will not be uh, I will not be online for that particular application. We have no minutes to confirm, therefore we can move on to the uh, on to the adjournment requests that we have. And the first adjournment request that is before us today, for item, item number one, and this is uh, 360, 362 um, First Avenue. It's a consent to subdivide the property into two separate parcels of land in order to create separate ownerships for each half of an existing three-story semi-detached dwelling. The uh, 
request for uh, adjournment has come from the uh, planning department. Ms. McKeela, yes. can you articulate your request for adjournment, please? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. So the planning department has no concerns with the application, but the adjournment is requested to allow time for the applicant to apply for minor variances. While the parking space uh, is not legally yet established, the frontier design is implemented to accommodate this parking space. And the front yard design as implemented is not in conformity with the section 107 of the zoning bylaw being located between the front wall and the street. And potentially there are two other minor variances may be required. And those would be percentage of the area of the yard occupied by the driveway? Yes, and, and the front and yard, front yeah. yard landscaping, yes. And, uh, and front yard landscaping, all right. All right, um, the applicant is, uh, Mr. Casey, is he there? I am, can you hear me? Mr. Casey, yes, Mr. Casey, you've heard the, uh, the planning department request uh, a, uh, an adjournment on this item. The department has also indicated that there are additional variances likely. That's right, um, so just to, uh, and, and I, I believe you, well, I included a letter um, a few days ago that I was hoping you, you guys had read. Um, yes. The whole point of the application, um, or sorry, well, I guess I guess what I want to say is I, I designed the home to core, like to fit with all bylaws and everything like that. I didn't want any minor variances or anything like that. And at the initial, um, what, you know, when I went and got my building permits, that was the case when I, um, and, and I, I basically have a tree that is on the, uh, essentially the corner of the property. So if I wanted to do a straight laneway from the street to the parking, the tree would have to die. And I don't want that to happen. Born and raised in the Glebe, as you read, I like trees, I wanna keep trees. I planted a tree in the backyard before I even got started so that I could have some more trees you know, anyway, the point is, it's a beautiful big tree, and I wanted to keep it, but I also didn't. Well, that's want also to... that's also for your information, Mr. Casey. That's also a city tree, so it doesn't belong to you. No, I, I get that. I get that. Um, it's not on my property, but it's on the corner, and it would be uh -huh. in the way of um, a straight shot laneway. Um, and so, what I did was I built the house, and I showed a, a walking path, um, and then um, I, but the the time is of the essence for me uh, and my brother uh, and his wife. And um, we wanted to make this as smooth a transition as possible, as smooth a process as possible. And so what I did was I applied for the severance of the two units. Um, and I intend to come back and do another hearing with the minor variances. My concern is uh, by, by right, if, if I've or my understanding is by right, if I can, I can build the house completely conforming to all zoning, the structure's there, I can sever it. And, and no one can really have any grounds to complain because I did exactly the rules and I didn't have any minor variances. But my worry is with a hearing and a particularly um, obstructive neighbor, uh, I'm worried that, um, that if I tie the hearing together with the hearing for the, the um, like, the severance and the minor variance, if it's in one hearing, they may appeal the decision and I can't afford literally the time uh, or the money to be delayed from that respect. So as it stands right now, I hand dug the laneway to protect the roots. I consulted with the arborists. Uh, I hand dug this lane uh, that, that curves to avoid the tree. And I understand that that will require a minor variance and I'm happy to do that. Uh, I don't have a depressed curb right now. So as soon as the snow banks recede, you're going to be taking your bumper off every time you come and go. So it's not practical. It's not a long-term thing. I need to get the minor variance. I need to do that. And I get that. I understand that. But it's the time is of the essence here for me. So that's why I wanted to do the one application for the severance so that it's simple and clean. And then if someone does choose to appeal uh, the minor variance for the laneway, uh, even though it's definitely the better move, it's a nice organic, you know, 
great like curve and the tree gets capped and everything they can appeal and and even though it's not logical uh, i I'm, I'm afraid uh, i can't trust that logic is dictating these a uh, particular neighbor's decision so that that's my that's my kind of raison d'etre for this thing um that being said if you guys choose to um postpone the hearing um and tie this thing all together i'm gonna i'm gonna forget about the laneway i'll move the laneway and and, and i'll take the tree out uh, you know legally and through the right channels and everything like that it's the last thing i want to do but i can't risk like i if I can go and not do a minor variance, uh, or if, if you're forcing my hand, I should say, uh, to, to, to go to the minor variance route uh, and the severance in the same you know, event, I can't risk it. So I'm going to have to say, well, you know, sure, postpone the hearing, but it's going to be the exact same paperwork and everything like that because I'm not going to go for the minor variance and I'm just going to take the tree out so that I can have a straight laneway. And, and again, Mr. Casey, that I don't want to do that. City. That belongs to the city, and if the city decides that they're not going to issue a permit to take that tree down, it's not coming down. That's I not understand. your tree. I, I, I understand. Well, let's, not, let's not assume that no. you're taking down a tree. I, I understand. Um, I'm just I saying. Hope so. I'm just saying. I, I'm. I've been fighting to keep this tree since the planning stage. Uh, I, I want to keep this tree. I'm mm -hmm. just worried that there's Where's the forestry department. By the way, pardon me. So does the forestry department of the city of Ottawa. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I, I get it. We, it. It's a beautiful tree. It contributes to the, to the streetscape. And there's a, oh. I mean, if you've seen the street, there's a big time lack of, of serious trees on this, this particular block. Yeah. So if, if you could, if you could make it a condition, like I know, you know, I noticed that some of the comments or remarks was let's make it a condition to uh, you know, sh show me your your permit drawings because the, there's the in-law suite in the basement. You need a fire rating. Show us that there's the separate utilities coming in uh, on on the grading plan. Show us your grading plan. Those are conditions that uh, that I, I saw in the comments, and I've supplied that information just this morning. Thank you, Maddie, for dealing with this this whole time. If you're watching, um, and so uh, you know, I. I Included in some kind of condition uh, that, but I, I really need the severance is, is what I'm saying. I really love to be heard today. Uh, I really like the severance and it, it doesn't make any sense for me not to come back and do the minor variance at a second hearing. But I, I'm just concerned that, that the second, that, that if I get this thing tied together, I'm going to be in big trouble. Yeah, I'm going to get appealed. And if, um, you, if you intend to leave your driveway there, you're going to have to get a minor variance. No, and I would love to leave the driveway there. I don't want to take out the tree. I want to go for the minor variance, but my concern. Uh, so, so I just want a second here. I want a separate hearing for the minor variance for that, because my concern is this particular neighbor I've mentioned. Um, we can't discuss issues between you I know I know but I'm just saying that's my that's my reasoning is is that I fear that there's going to be an appeal whether it's warranted or not I fear that there's going to be an appeal that's and that's the uh, that's the right of a property owner in this province to appeal a minor variance application and, and, Mr. I, Wildman, and I, thanks Mr. Wildman you had a comment uh, just two quick questions, Chair. Uh, Ms. Wakula, your, your position is that the two should should remain together and not piecemeal the planning uh, process for this? Um, the problem is that the, uh, as per the photos uh, from the staff uh, site visit, the car is already parked there. So uh, I'm concerned just uh, that legally <clears throat> it will be hard for us to understand how the applicant will return for this minor variance if they're not submitting it during the severance. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Young, uh, what's the likelihood of a, of a permit to remove that tree um, in, in your opinion? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the likelihood of a tree removal permit is very low. And the applicant has worked with forestry all the way along and has um, done a great job of trying to protect the tree. So, I mean, we don't have an issue with it as currently, but uh, we would not agree to removal for that. Okay, so that's not on the table. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Ms. McLean, I think you had comments as well and a, suggest a possible suggestion. Well, um, it is our practice to consider all applications for a property related to a property at the one hearing. So that is our normal practice. And we cannot ignore the fact that there's a zoning infraction going on and what the implication of a variance might be if the property were already severed and whether it be the sufficient land, the width of the driveway. And, and, and so I, I think um, that it needs to be um, uh, adjourned and the whole, um, the all the applications heard at the same time. That's my viewpoint at this point. And I agree with Ms. McLean. Mr. Wildman. Uh, I agree, Mr. Chair. All right. Mr. Casey, you've heard from the three panel members. I think what we're going to do is, uh, can you get this resolved within two weeks? Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do my we best. Have, I mean, we have, we have yeah, space, we have space and on the agenda in two weeks. And if you can get this done in two weeks, that slows you down by the grand total of two weeks and we can deal with the item. Okay. Uh, and this would be, um, what, what is the date? What is that date? Uh, Mr. Chair, he need to file a minor variance application. So it's going to oh, have yeah, to be a right. sine die yeah. application and, and a circulation. So I don't think the two week oh, is, no, is probably uh, four, more like four weeks, correct? Well, I think it'd probably be signy die, and it'll be dependent on when he gets the application filed. They can, the staff can set it for a hearing, but uh, until the application is filed, it, it, a hearing date uh, can't be determined. So, how soon can you file an application, Mr. Casey? I mean, if you, if someone can shoot me an email to say these are exactly the minor variances I need to pursue, um, then. Uh, then I mean I'm I'm gonna get it done in you know the next two two three days. Okay. Well, why don't we adjourn this sine die and hope for hope that we can see you back here within uh, within a several weeks. I think Miss Vakula is probably the person you need to talk to. She's the planner on the file. You have her email address, I believe, and her phone number. Uh I've been coordinating with Maddie uh, a lot okay. recently, but I, I have so a problem, but, but she's not the planner on the file. Ms. Bakula is. Okay. So uh, I would suggest you, that you give her a, or she can contact you. Could, could you, uh, could you shoot me an email? Do you have my email? Mr. Casey, I can follow up with you. I will require site plan with soft landscaping calculation and the area occupied by driveway, just for you to give a heads up to your architect. Thank you. Okay. All right. So what we'll do then is we'll adjourn this signy die. Um, there will need to be a recirculation. Hopefully we'll deal with it later this, deal with the items uh, later this month. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Okay. Thank you. The next application that's up for adjournment are items four and five on the agenda, 925 bracket 927 on bracket Fillets Road. It's a consent to subdivide the property of two separate parcels of land for the construction of two new detached dwellings with one dwelling on each of the newly created lots. And it's the, uh, once again, the planning, the planning department has requested the the adjournment, uh, Ms. McCullough, the planner on the file. Would you like yes. to articulate, articulate the request for adjournment, please? Yes, Mr. Chair. So during the review, um, the about noted application uh, is not in conformity with the Carlton Heights secondary plan that restricts the driveways, the establishing new driveways on the lots no matter how many lots are proposed. So the planning staff requires more time to assess the compliance of the application with the new official plan, new Carlton Heights secondary plan and zoning bylaw. We would ask to schedule the next hearing for February 16. Well, there's no requirement here to go to sine die on this? Uh, for now, not as per uh, direction from senior planning staff. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe Mr. Segreto is the agent for the applicant. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Michael Segreto. Mr. Segreto, um, you've, heard the, you've heard the department's comments. 
I have. I'm a little bit concerned with the adjournment. I don't know if it's really going to be advantageous or not to this file because this is the first time that I hear of this driveway uh, access uh, that is required now, the, um, the private approach access. And I don't even know if planning knows where they stand on this with this new bylaw that's in place. Um, but um, what I'll do though is I, I will, you know, if we can adjourn it for two weeks. I will have discussions with the planner. I've had some discussions with them all, already. We'll see okay. if we can come to some sort of compromise, but I don't know if it's really going to uh, help okay. out or not. Well, with luck, I don't. We'll, be, we'll be back here in, in two weeks and dealing okay. with the application. Fair enough, fair enough, thank you. Mr. Chair, I thought that the planning department was asking to February the 16th. Could you just clarify that or? Yes, we can. Yes, through Mr. Chair, February 16th is sufficient time. Yes. So. Thank you. Okay. Yep. So we'll adjourn this application until the 16th of February. And yep. we'll see you then. Okay, thank you. Okay. That concludes the request for adjournment. So we'll now move to the regular agenda. First item on the regular agenda is 353 Wilmont Avenue. It's a uh, minor variance, minor variances to permit reduced lot with the lot area. Proposed to demolish existing two story detached dwelling and construct a new three story, three unit dwelling in its place. The planning department uh, was requesting an adjournment on this application, but has uh, has uh, pulled its uh, its uh, its request because uh, a revised site plan was. Uh, was filed with the department. The department is satisfied with the uh, with what they have for them. So, um, to Mr. Segreto, you're the agent. And we'll do Mr. The, Chair, and we'll do the uh, we'll do the The oath or solemn declaration to you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time. I swear that the sign was posted. All right. <coughs> so, the uh, if you, very very briefly, Mr. Segreto. What we have, what we have in front of you, Mr. Chair and panel and committee members, is an application for minor variance. Uh, we're in a um, <clears throat> in a um, R3S zone, which permits triplexes. What my client would like to do is demolish the existing dwelling, which is on site. I think we have a uh, a presentation there. I can go through that very quickly, just to show you uh, the layout of the property and the green space and so on and so forth. If, if, if they can uh, put that on, please. So this is the subject property. This is a streetscape that uh, we've done. Um, you can clearly see this uh, gray house is the house that uh, uh, my client would like to demolish and replace it with a, uh, with a triplex. Next slide, please. And that's the proposed triplex that we're doing. In order to have this develop move forward, I will need two minor variances. And the two variances that I'm looking for is basically my lot width to allow a reduced lot width of 10.06 meters, whereas the bylaw requires a minimum of 12 meters. In addition to that, to permit a reduced lot area of 336.61 square meters, whereas the bylaw requires 360 square meters. Um, so again, uh, the zoning allows for it. Uh, uh, it is uh, a property with other, I believe there's a couple of other duplexes in the area. You can clearly see from my site plan that we have uh, our landscape in the front. We meet the side yard setbacks. We meet front yard setbacks. We meet the rear yard amenity area and the rear yard uh, 
setback as well. And we've allocated one spot off to the right-hand side of the property with a parking space there. And um, we feel that this development is appropriate. We feel that the variances that we're requesting are minor in nature. And we also believe that the four tests have been achieved. And, uh, my understanding is that planning has no concerns with that this application and uh, that, uh, we're okay with it. Yes, planning has no 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 concerns. None of the other agencies have any concerns, and there are no no additional conditions that are being asked to be imposed. That's correct. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Members of the panel? No. Uh, all right. Brad, are you aware of the uh, the comments from the uh, from the from the facility next next door to you, the uh, the church next door regarding the common passageway and access. Yes, I am, and I believe we're going to be okay with that. My client is not here at the moment, but I think we can address those issues with the uh, property next door, and I believe that he's willing to work with them. Yeah, and these are these are civil matters, so they're not before the committee of adjustment in any anyway. That's right. Yeah, so, Miss McLean, you had a comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Given the nature of the variances for lot within lot area, I think that the committee is looking for uh, more information on lot pattern and dimensions dimensions of lots on this block for this type of use. So I just wondered if uh, if the applicant's agent had that information. Um, <clears throat> Ms. McLean, I'm not sure if we did a uh, a lot fabric on this one here. I'd have to go back to uh, uh, the file there. Um, I don't know if there's any comparables with respect to triplexes, but I know in fact, if, if we if you can put it on, there is a, there is a, a lot fabric that we've done that I can show you with semi detaches and with commercial area and multi units, not in particular to uh, triplexes, but if 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 the uh, coordinator can go to my lot fabric, it might give you a little bit more of a view on this. Okay. <clears throat> So there it is, the lot fabric. You can see the subject property there, which is sort of a reddish color next to it. Uh, the blue, which is a semi-detached, the blue indicates semi-detached. And there's a green one, uh, which indicates multi-units, but uh, with triplexes, there's not too many triplexes on that site. That's it. Mr. Segreto. Okay. Other questions for the applicant regarding this request? Well, I just think, Mr. Chair, the information, given the nature of the request, um, it, it's fine to say there's a semi-detached next. So we have no information on lot widths or lot areas. It, it's uh, it's uh, not sufficient in my mind um, to deal with this um, type of request. So I'll just leave it there. You have any further details, Mr. Segreto? Is that the only the only materials you can provide us with? At the moment, Mr. Chair, I'm, unfortunately, that's all that I have right now. It's just my lock fabric that I've indicated. I believe the planner has a comment, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If it does assist the committee, the property that is labeled as a multi-unit on Mr. Segreto's diagram is uh, of the same lot width and actually a smaller lot area than what is being requested post minor variance. And could you just refer to that address, uh, Mr. Hamilton? Would you know that offhand or Mr. Segreto? 365 Wilmot, I believe. Okay, I find that's very helpful. Thank you. You want to reserve on this, Ms. McLean? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Mr. Segreto. Um, what we'll do is we'll reserve on this application, and uh, you'll receive our uh, our notice of decision in ten days. Thank you.
Uh, Mr. Chair, there's also been a, a last minute adjournment request for uh, item 11, 11 Sherbrooke. 11, all right. Thank you. All right, regarding item 11, which is 11 bracket 13 on bracket Sherbrooke Avenue, uh, the adjournment request has come from, I'm assuming the agent's applicant or the applicant's agent. Uh, good afternoon, uh, panel, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, it is. Uh, Paul Kershaw from P2 Concepts for the H, uh, for the applicant. And the and the address and your address for the record, please, Mr. Kershaw. Uh, sorry, the address that we're doing or my address? Your address. Uh, 739 Ridgewood Avenue, Ottawa. Okay. And the uh, and your, your, the reason why you want a uh, need an adjournment at this time? Uh, their uh, owner has uh, shifted gear to uh, ask for uh, minor variance for three lots instead of two for singles to go on that. So it requires minor variance as well. So we're just getting our ducks in the row to uh, apply for that. Um, I think Mr. Wildman had some concerns regarding Hydro's comments that you may, I'm, I'm assuming you're aware of Hydro's comments. Uh, I stuff. didn't receive any comments at all. For this project. Well, Mr. Wildman, if you'd like to articulate that, Mr. Kershaw, possibly. Thank you, Chair. Um, just pulling up the comments. So uh, we, we often get comments from Hydro, and the comments we have this time are that um, any reduction uh, of side yard setbacks may prevent the electrical servicing of the property. And this is the line that is somewhat of a concern to us. The applicant's proposed design shall satisfy Hydro Ottawa safety offset clearances prior to approval by the committee. So in light of the, uh, the uh, request for adjournment, um, I, I would suggest to you that you need to resolve this with, with Hydro uh, before coming back to us. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand the comment. For, I don't well, you'll have to take that up with Hydro as to where, what we're doing here is, is telling you that Hydro is saying that before they want, they don't want the committee making an approval decision until you satisfy their safety offset clearance requirements. So how you ch how you choose to do that with hydro is it, it doesn't matter. It's okay. just we need to know that hydro is satisfied with how, whatever it is you're proposing to service there, and they want that before we we deal with the approval. So you have no time now because you're requesting yep. an adjournment to to follow up with, uh, with Hydro and just say, you know, what is it you're looking for from us to, uh, to satisfy us? Absolutely, I yeah, we would have done that. Yeah, if we were going, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Thank you, Chair. So is there a necessity to adjourn this signy die? Yeah, what, uh, we, what that's what course? we were requesting, if that's all right. Okay, all right, fine. Ms. McLean, you have a comment, question? Uh, just to cl clarify for Mr. Kershaw, it's it's incumbent upon the owner, the applicant, the agent to obtain the comments that are on file prior to the hearing. So they're not automatically, I don't believe, automatically sent out that they have to inquire of staff and obtain those comments. So for the forthcoming applications, uh, he'll be required to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All in favor of adjourning this application, sign it up. And is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Kershaw. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Yep. Right. Next application we'll deal with today. And three on the agenda: 2070 Scott Street and 328 Winona Avenue. And these are minor variances to permit an increase in the number of stories and a reduced building st setback, step back, sorry, and to permit a stepped terrace and a ventilation shaft on the south side of the building. It is proposed to construct a mixed use 26 story high rise apartment building with commercial and retail at grade on this vacant property. And the, uh, the agent for the applicant is Mr. Kelly. Is he there? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of Kearney. Mr. Kelly, your address for the record, please. 
is 240 Michael Copeland Drive, Suite okay. 200. Okay. I note uh, on the application that uh, item or uh, variance B has been amended to read to permit a reduced building step, step back of 3.2 meters for the northeast corner of the post tower, whereas the bylaw requires a minimum building setback of five meters. So that's a, that's revised from 5.5. That's correct. Thank you. Um, and uh, the panel is uh, in reviewing the uh, reviewing the materials um, is looking at variance A and wondering if the language variance A shouldn't be changed very slightly to read to permit an increase in the number of stories to 26 in area D, which is where you're up, where your increase in height is, whereas the bylaw permits a maximum of 25 stories. That tightens it up a little. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, it's area E from our understanding. Area that e the height area would be. E. Yeah, right. because it's, 20, it's 25 stories permitted in area E, okay. and we're requesting 26 in area E. Oh, it's E and not D. All right. Yes, that's correct. Okay. But you're okay with that change to in area E? It just it just clarifies? Yep, that's that sounds good. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll amend that, that variance <clears throat> right here. And now, um, so this is... These changes are coming to us because of site plan discussions and a, and a, all right, if you could very, very briefly explain what, uh, what you're requesting. So if, uh, if a brief uh, presentation is what you're requesting, Mr. Yeah. Chair, um, we can skip right to, um, we can start with uh, the next slide, please. So I'll just go over a, a background of the uh, proposed development, how we got here. So to provide a, the, the background for the proposed development on the subject site uh, and implementing zoning amendment uh, to permit the development of a 25 story mixed use building, uh, it was approved by city council on November 25th, 2020. Okay. Uh, a section 37 agreement was required as part of the zoning approval uh, and the total gross floor area of the proposed development has been reduced through the site plan approval process. Uh, no changes to the determination of Section 37 contributions for the proposed development are required. Okay. Uh, site plan approval for the proposed development was received on uh, June 5th, 2021. And through coordination with city staff during the approval process, modifications to the design were identified to improve the building form and function uh, that do require relief from provisions of the state specific zoning. Uh, and then uh, on December 8th, 2021, City Council approved uh, the motion for planning committee to permit a minor variance application on the property, whereas uh, provisions of the Planning Act do not permit an application for minor variance before the second anniversary of the initial zoning amendment, which would have been uh, November 25th, 2022. Okay. If you can go to the next slide, please. So just uh, very briefly, the proposed development is a 26 story mixed use building, a uh, frontage on Scott Street, Churchill Avenue and Winona Avenue. There's an individual driveway that provides access from Winona uh, to an underground parking garage and a pedestrian walkway provides access along the south property line. Uh, proposed development has been designed to conform with site specific performance standards for building height, landscaped area, front yard, corner side yard and rear yard setbacks. Okay. You can go to the next slide, please. So with uh, respect to the required variances, uh, as shown on the image before you, there's a total of four variances that are requested uh, in order to modify site-specific provisions of the zoning bylaw, and I'll just walk through each of those with the members of the committee. Okay. So next slide, please. Uh, variance A, request to permit an increase in the approved number uh, of stories to 26, whereas the bylaw permits a maximum of 25 stories on Schedule 419 of the zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. So as shown on the top elevation, the original site plan submission proposed townhouse units along Winona Avenue and comprised a maximum of 25 stories. Uh, as shown on the bottom elevation before you, changes made to the podium level during the site plan approval process replaced the two-story townhouse units with a separate second floor. And that's highlighted in pink 
on the on the slide before you. Mm -hmm. So the addition of units on the second floor requires relief to increase the proposed number of uh, stories to 26. There's no increase to the approved building envelope or the maximum permitting building height on the subject site. Okay. Next slide, please. So as highlighted on the image before you, variance B requests to permit a reduced building step back of 3.2 meters for the northeast corner of the proposed tower, uh, whereas a minimum building height, a step back, sorry, of five meters is required on schedule 419 of the zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. So as shown on the image before you, the proposed reduction to the tower step back along Scott Street uh, maintains the original intent to recess the corners of the tower from the podium and to reduce potential visual impacts from the street and the public realm. Uh, next slide, please. So as highlighted on the image before you, variant C requests to permit a step terrace projecting a maximum of 3.5 meters above grade level on the south side of the building whereas no buildings are permitted in area F on schedule 419 of the zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. So as shown on the section image before you, the step terraces are designed to provide uh, sufficient vertical clearance uh, for vehicles to access the underground parking garage off Winona Avenue. Uh, the step terraces have been designed to cover the parking ramp for better functionality uh, and a more aesthetically pleasing design treatment. And please also note that the terraces are a maximum height of 3.5 meters, whereas the, the portion of the building located immediately to the east is three stories or uh, nine meters in height. Next slide, please. So just an, an, above, an above grade image. Uh, the design of the step terraces is integrated into the building, as you can see. Uh, and as part of that uh, landscape area through the incorporation of green roofs that are proposed. Uh, the proposed terraces step down from a maximum height of 3.5 meters at the east extent to approximately, well, sorry, approximately 1.5 meters at the west extent. And we also want to note uh, in this image that uh, the area is not intended for residents to access or for use as a private residential terrace. So moving on on the same slide to variance D, uh, the request is to permit a ventilation shaft. Uh, so you can go back one slide, please. So the, the request is to permit a ventilation shaft uh, to project a maximum of one meter above grade level along the southeast edge of the building, whereas no buildings are permitted in area F on schedule 419 of the zoning bylaw. So the ventilation shaft in this location is required to facilitate exhaust from the underground parking garage. And we also wanted to note that a vegetated planter has been incorporated uh, into the design of the, of the shaft to uh, soften the appearance along the pedestrian pathway and the south property line. Next slide, please. You're, uh, before we move on, um, yep. well, we can do it from this. You're aware of uh, you're aware of the next door neighbor's concerns regarding this ventilation shaft. Yeah, and that is on uh, our response is actually right here, uh, Mr. Chair, on the slide. Okay. So, in response to uh, the comments that have been received um, from the community. Um, we will note that the extent of the proposed step terraces are located greater than seven meters from the south property line, mm -hmm. as shown on the slide before you. Yep. Uh, and the extent of the proposed ventilation shaft is located just over 5.7 meters uh, from the south property line. So we, we suggest that the setbacks are, uh, that are provided are appropriate to mitigate any potential impacts on abutting properties to the south. And uh, just in addition to that, a privacy fence is also proposed uh, to screen the subject site from the abutting properties to the south. A privacy fence in the in proximate, proximate to the uh, to this air exhaust. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, it's it's located on. Uh, if you can see the dotted line, there's a there's a a note there detailing where the um, privacy fence will be located. The neighbor next the neighbor next door is, uh, I think, rightly concerned that. Her air quality is going to be impacted by by a multi-story garage exhaust. This is the only exhaust for this garage, I'm assuming. Uh, we can have the the architects on the call as well, Mr. Chair. We can have them confirm, but yeah, I believe it I'd, is. I'd, I'd like to know what who's done who's done what kind of work to uh, to assure the, uh, the the neighbor that they're not going to be breathing exhaust fumes all day long when the when the uh, when the wind blows the wrong way. And of course, there's also the uh, the issue of noise. That's an exhaust. There's obviously a fan attached to it, 
what kind of mitigative efforts have been made to uh, to reduce the uh, the audio and the noise emanating from this thing and, and the impact on the immediate neighbor to the south. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, David Snell from BDP Quadrangle Architects. Um, so, Snell. hi there. Um, we uh, we only received this comment uh, recently, but we can certainly uh, address it um, in terms of noise. Uh, it is only the uh, it's the only way of exhausting air from the garage. It would be operational, of course, on sensors uh, based on CO levels in the garage only. So it's not operating. Those fans are not operating at all times, of course. Uh, but uh, we would have to uh, consult with the mechanical engineers to understand anything further than that. I'm sorry, we don't have the mechanical engineers here, but uh, we could certainly do that. Uh, Is there any any possibility of extending that uh, that vent upwards, not just have it a meter off the ground? Absolutely, I, I think that would be possible, but uh, we would uh, you know, have to strike a balance, I guess, and and understand whether that's actually helping the situation or not. I think mm -hmm. that's really something that mechanical engineers would have to comment on. And uh, I take it you've got. You've got professional advice regarding the uh, regarding the impact of uh, potential impact on the, uh, the property immediately to the south from uh, from the uh, well, quite frankly, the polluted air coming out of the garage. I mean, clearly, it has to be appropriate for anybody walking along that pathway. Um, yeah. So it's not just the neighbors, uh, yeah. and um, so the design needs to be uh, suitable for that. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Please continue, sir, with your uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just making sure I covered that off. So, um, if you can uh, proceed to the next slide, please. We'll just go through a, a discussion of the four tests. Thank you. So the first test for minor variance uh, is a general intent and purpose of the official plan is maintained. Uh, the subject site is designated traditional main street uh, on the enforced official plan. Uh, the proposed development of the subject site is an example of intensification within the traditional main street designation. Policies of the enforced official plan support development of a compact mixed use building that optimizes use of land, frames the street, provides active frontages, improves access to the sidewalk and complements desirable characteristics of development along Scott Street and within the Westboro community. Uh, the subject site is designated Main Street Corridor in the urban, inner urban transect of the adopted official plan. Policies of the adopted official plan encourage infill and intensification within the urban area. The proposed development on the subject site is an example of infill and intensification within the inner urban transect and Main Street Corridor designations. So the proposed development provides a mix of uses, including residential and commercial along Scott Street and supports the growth of 15 minute neighborhoods. Um, further, the subject site is located in the Richmond Road Westboro Secondary Plan area. Policies of the Richmond Road Westboro Secondary Plan support development of a mixed use high rise building on the subject site that will optimize the use of land and is designed to be compatible with the surrounding community. Uh, and just to note that the secondary plan policies have been uh, adopted into the new official plan as well. Uh, the minor variances maintain the general intent and purpose of the enforced official plan and the adopted official plan. So the second test for minor variance is that the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw is maintained. Uh, the proposed variances are required uh, to permit modifications to the building design that are made through the site plan approval process and to facilitate the development of a mixed use high rise building, which is a permitted use in the site specific zoning. The proposed development is designed to be compatible with the land use pattern and existing characteristics of the uh, surrounding neighborhood and Westboro community. The proposed development meets performance standards of the site specific zoning for building height, landscaped area, front yard, corner side yard, and rear yard setbacks. The requested minor variances will have no adverse impacts on the streetscape or the functionality of the site. The requested minor variance maintain the general intent and purpose of the City of Ottawa zoning bylaw. Uh, and then the third test for minor variance is that the minor variances are considered desirable for the use of land. 
The requested variances do not modify the approved design of the uh, building or the maximum building height. A reduction to the building step back at the northeast corner of the tower above level six by 1.8 meters does not impact the streetscape along uh, Scott Street or Winona Avenue. Step terraces facilitate access to the underground parking garage, contribute to the landscaped amenity area above grade, and are appropriately set back from abutting buildings along the south property line. Uh, further, the ventilation shaft facilitates exhaust from the underground parking garage and a vegetated edge is provided to soften the interface with the pedestrian pathway. Uh, and we feel is appropriately set back from the abutting buildings along the south property line. The requested variances are intended to implement design enhancements to the form and function of the building and are compatible with the context of the surrounding neighborhood. The proposed variances are appropriate for the subject site. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, subject site is located at the intersection of Churchill Avenue and Scott Street. Uh, the Westboro Transit Station, uh, Transitway Station is uh, located approximately 300 meters to the east of the subject site. Subject site is near many neighborhood amenities such as shops and restaurants that are located uh, to the south in Westboro Village. It is also located near schools, parks, and Westboro Beach. The requested variances facilitate an appropriate form and scale of development near established neighborhood amenities and transit. And the requested variances will facilitate uh, development of appropriate mixed use building, providing opportunities for housing and commercial uses that are compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. The minor variances are considered desirable for the use of land. And next slide, please. So the fourth test for minor variance is the minor variance is considered minor in nature. The proposed development meets the site specific performance standards for building height, landscape area, front yard, corner side yard, and rear yard setbacks. The requested variances do not modify the approved design of the building or the maximum building height. A reduction to the building step back at the northeast corner of the tower above level six by 1.8 meters does not impact streetscape along Scott Street or Winona Avenue. The step terraces at the rear of the subject site are integrated with the form and materials of the building podium and are designed as part of the landscape area through the introduction of green roofs. Step terraces are designed to minimize any visual impact and maintain appropriate separation from abutting lots to the south of the subject site. Uh, this ventilation shaft is designed to integrate with the building podium and provides a vegetated edge as a buffer to minimize visual impacts from the public realm and along the south property line. Requested variances are intended to implement design enhancements to the form and function of the building and are compatible with the context of the surrounding neighborhood. And as a result, the proposed variances are considered minor in nature. So just in summary, uh, the proposed development of 2070 Scott Street and 328 Winona Avenue maintains the general intent and purpose of the enforced official plan, the adopted official plan, and provisions of the zoning bylaw. The requested variances are considered desirable for the use of land and are minor in nature, and the proposed development represents good land use planning. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, we would welcome any further uh, questions from the committee and uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Any comments from uh, committee? Ms. McLean. Um, just two um, observations or thoughts. I'm just wondering whether or not a, cond a condition would be appropriate to um, impose some kind of mitigation measures for noise and emissions to the satisfaction of the planning department. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure that, that's a question I have. And then the other question I have is, was area um, F on the schedule? Does anyone um, know of area F on this schedule that was designated for no buildings? If that was to address the concerns of the, of the residential neighborhood to the South? Can either planning staff or the agent um, address that? Madam, through the chair, um, I'm hoping Mr. Hamilton might be able to assist. Uh, we were not involved with the site plan approval or the rezoning. We were only brought on to deal with the minor variance application. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair, I don't have the specifics as to what the limit on having no buildings was for area F, but it does appear when you look at the areas as they transition from the southern portion of the property into the interior, the heights that are permitted do get higher. So it does appear that way. 
or it at least may have that effect uh, if it was not the, the main intention at least. So just to be clear that, that Area F um, could have been, um, or remains vacant because of the concerns maybe expressed by the, the neighbors. That's what I'm struggling with. And I guess the, the other um, question for the agent is um, whether a condition um, would be appropriate here or, or could be imposed to address the noise and, and emissions from that uh, ventilation shaft. Um, through the chair, if that was to the satisfaction of the uh, general manager of, of planning, real estate and development, I think we could work with that condition. And as Mr. Snell has indicated, we work with mechanical electrical engineers to uh, try to ensure that the noise from any exhaust fans was minimal. Or if there needs to be an attenuation fence or more buffering, I guess that would be part of the consideration. Possibly, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anything, Mr. Wildman, any comments, questions? All right. well, thank you, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Chown, Mr. Snell. Um, I think what we're going to do is reserve on this application. And uh, We'll receive our decision uh, in 10 days. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. The next application is our items four and five, 486 Wentworth, and I am gonna shut off my audio and my video because I am recusing myself on this particular application, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wildman will handle this for me. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I'll just give you a minute. We have the uh, agent or owner, please. Good afternoon, Michael Segretto here. Mr. Segretto, or will you be doing the uh, swearing the oath? I will. Okay. You solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing as instructed and was clearly visible and legible during that time. I swear. Thank you. And for the record, Mr. Segreto, your address, please. The address is 30 Concourse Gate, Unit 47. Okay. Uh, the committee has reviewed the file fairly extensively. Um, we don't feel a presentation is, is needed. Um, you do have uh, a series of uh, conditions that are being applied. This is a matter that's a lot area and a lot width. So we're going to restrict our discussion to that. Um, with respect to the, uh, the conditions, um, I will read them out to you. And uh, if you have any comments, uh, please let me know. Cash and lieu, um, existing dwelling to be removed servicing plan, accessory structure, removed or relocated, grading and drainage plan, grading and servicing plan to retain and protect existing trees. Uh, Ms. McLean may have a comment on that. Uh, notice on title of noise due to nearby LRT, a Juma, and noise attenuation study or design units to add central air to notice on title uh, of environmental noise. Um, I'm not sure why seven and nine aren't rolled up together, but uh, so be it. Uh, any comments, Mr. Segreto? No, I'm okay with those conditions. They're pretty standard conditions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. McLean, did you have a few comments to make? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just on the, uh, the request from by Forestry for the grading and servicing plan and just the, the um, request agreed to provide, I just wondered if if they could indicate what kind of evidence they're looking for. Um, I, I, I'd like to suggest that maybe the wording needs to be like file a grading and servicing plan to protect and retain the trees, but I, I'm just gonna uh, wait for the response. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Young. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I mean, the, the wording can be changed. Uh, the intent is really just to show on the grading and servicing plan that the tree uh, will be retained. So it's to ultimately change where the grading and services are. Um, in the tree information report, it noted that 
the existing city tree may be impacted by the services, but there was no indication of where they were. So the intent of this is just to make sure that the services are planned in an area outside of the critical root zone of that tree. So it can be the same grading and servicing plan that is already required, and it just has to have the tree located on it. So, so Ms. Young, I, I assume you wouldn't have any objection to putting the words provide a grading and servicing plan to demonstrate? Nope. Okay, that so would we'll be do totally something. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, is, is that it for Ms. Young, uh, Ms. McLean? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, with respect to the minor variances, uh, we would uh, be looking to have these tied to the revised plans. Mr. Segreto, is that okay with you? That's fine. Thank you. Um, will there be, uh, Ms. McLean, you, you had a comment about a privacy fence, I believe. Just a comment from the community association. I'm just, just changing. Um, indicated that there has been some agreement um, about an erection of a privacy fence. So if we could get confirmation from the agent that he's in agreement with that, it's not typically something the committee would impose, but we could reflect uh, an agreement um, in the body of the decision. The other question I had too was similarly to the previous one, Mr. Segreto, when we're looking for reduced lot areas and widths, we're looking, the committee would like to see some uh, evidence on the lot pattern and dimensions in the immediate area. Um, I believe there's a, again, if you go to my lot fabric, I believe there is a number of semi-detached dwellings that have been severed in that particular area in the last couple of years that resemble what we're doing for you today. I'm not sure if they can put up the slide, but uh, there is evidence of other lots that are very similar that have been done in the past. So you can see that we've indicated that there are a number of semis in the area uh, that have been uh, severed. Um, as an example, uh, all the ones there like uh, 45 BBA and uh, there are semis that are, that, are, that are there that exist. You can clearly see 502, 504. That is a semi that has been established and a couple of more down, uh, down the road as well, a little bit further up towards the north, 461, 463. So there is a pattern. I believe there may be even photographs as well. If you can continue on, there should be some photographs of existing semis that, uh, uh, that have been approved uh, and would these semis, Mr. Uh, Segreto, have similar lot woods and lot areas? I guess that's the type of information we're looking it, for. It, the, the, Ms. McLean, yes, they're on 50 foot lots. They're on 50 foot lots, yes. Okay, thank you. With respect to the fence, I believe uh, 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 one of the neighbors wanted uh, a glass fence, I think on one of the decks in the back. I, I was reading that in one of the notices and I believe that the owner has agreed to that fence uh, or that railing to be done um, with the neighbor in the back. So I think that's fine. Okay, thank you. We'll have that reflected in the uh, yeah. decision that that was, um, that that was covered. Yeah. Um, to the committee uh, coordinator, are there any scheduled uh, speakers today? I, I do see someone's raising their hand, but I just wanted to check with the uh, committee coordinator. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, um, Mr. E. McCallum is registered to speak. Okay, uh, Mr. McCallum, please. I did it. <laughs> yeah. good, uh, good afternoon. If you could uh, state your name and your address, please, for the record. Sure. Uh, Ian McCallum, uh, 1206B Byron Avenue. And I'm the uh, Community Association President for Wood Park. Okay. Um, we helped, uh, uh, we worked with the neighbors to uh, solicit ideas, um, supported a meeting with the developer, uh, Roberto, uh, back in December. And so the, the current design is a lot of those, uh, those discussions, and we're really quite grateful. 
to, to make it a steam and Roberto for, uh, for instance, they dropped the height of the uh, building, lowering it further into the ground, changing the pitch of the roof. So of course, now you're not seeing a request for a height variance, but we're grateful for, uh, for, for doing that. Um, with, this, with the sloping backyard, the question becomes for the rear, uh, the rear residents, the scale and the scope of the new project. So we're, we're quite grateful that uh, the privacy screens and using current walls have been agreed to. Um, and, you know, we accept that uh, we don't get everything, but uh, 1.2 for uh, rear current walls is very acceptable. And the side screens at 1.83 are great. Um, so we're very supportive and we just would uh, appreciate I believe you had already suggested tying the uh, tying the committee's uh, decision to the uh, to the to the plans, and Mike's been agreement to that, and that's the type of certainty uh, certainly the, the neighbors would appreciate. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Ms. McLean, any any objections to uh, to proceeding with the decision now? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to hear from Mr. Segreto that he's uh, he's okay with tying this amount of variance to the revised plans that were filed? Yeah, uh, uh, Ms. McLean, no problem at all. Okay, thank you. Okay, on approval as amended, uh, Ms. McLean. Okay, you're approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. The committee coordinator could uh, get Mr. Blatherick back, please. Hello. Sorry, I see you're back now. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Wildman. The next item on the agenda are items six and seven, 1051 Second Avenue. And this is a consent to subdivide the property into two separate parcels of land for the construction of a semi detached dwelling with one unit on each of the newly created lots. The existing detached dwelling is to be demolished. Minor variances are also requested to permit reduced lot widths and lot areas. And I believe Mr. Segreto is the agent on this one as well. Yes, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me, Mr. Segreto? Yeah. Hello? I can't hear you. Hello? Yeah, okay. So we have to go through the oath, the oath or solemn declaration. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time? I do swear. Okay. All right, please, uh, please proceed, Mr. Segreto, with your, uh, with your presentation. Can we uh, have my uh, presentation? So this is the subject property, this little bungalow that we have here on C Cord, 1051 C Cord, existing single family dwelling, which is uh, beside a two story semi detached on the west side and another two-story semi-detached on the east side. And what my client would like to do is demolish the single family dwelling and hopefully develop a similar building to what uh, is adjacent to him. Slide. So that is the proposed uh, semi, two-story semi that we're providing. Uh, it is a two-story semi with secondary units in the basement. And as uh, we've sent out the letter to the community association, as, as everyone knows, uh, they're looking at possibly four bedrooms in the secondary unit and another four bedrooms on the main level of the house. Next slide, please. 
So this is the site plan. As you notice, there is no parking on this site. There's just greenery uh, in the front. Parking is uh, uh, not required on this site. And uh, one of the units next to us has the same identical thing with no parking in the front. Next slide. It's the uh, proposed R plan. The variances that I'm requesting again today are basically lot width and lot area only. All other performance standards are met, front yards, side yards, rear yards, and height. The variance that I'm requesting is basically to reduce the lot width to 7.6 meters, whereas the bylaw requires nine meters, and to permit a lot area of 231.9 square meters, whereas the bylaw requires a minimum of 270 square meters. Um, next slide, please. This is the subject property in red, and you can see that the one building, the semi-detached next door to us is, uh, is the semi. And also from my photographs, you can clearly see that there's two semis beside us. Next. Here's the outlying area of the uh, proposed development, next. This is an example of one of the semis on the street at 1055A and 1055B Secord Avenue, two story with a 50 foot lot width. The other one is being built as we speak or was being built uh, this past summer. It's another semi which is under construction and has been built, next slide. Uh, these are duplexes that are on the street just a little bit further up the road and these duplexes I'm not sure whether the basement units are used uh, with additional bedrooms or not. And I don't know if there are three bedrooms in these duplexes or four bedrooms. I have no idea, but they are duplexes on this street. And you can clearly see there's a handful of them. There's a number of them at 1063, 1066, 1070, 1072, and 1080. Next. And this basically is, uh, I guess, the tree information report that we have with the trees in the back and the trees that are going to be planted that we've agreed to. That's my presentation for now. How does this, uh, how does your, your proposal meet the, uh, meet the four tests of the planning act, Mr. Segreto? Well, with respect to the four tests, I believe that we're going to be fine. Um, uh, there's pure evidence of the same sort of development to the right and to the left of us. Um, the variances that are in front of you are similar to the variances that have been approved in the past on the other, uh, the other two buildings next to us. Um, variances are minor in nature. It fits in well with the streetscape of that um, neighborhood, the zoning allows for it. Uh, the official plan is in support of it. And uh, I believe it's desirable. It's, it's something that has been done in the past, something that can be done now. And it's something that the city and uh, the policies that are in place that it, are encouraging this sort of development in this particular neighborhood, which allows for this type of development. Are you assuming that everybody who's gonna live here will never have a car? Um, no, but the transit is like five minutes away, and I think the city is in support of more people taking the transit. Billings Bridge is just five minutes up the road, and uh, yes, the university is uh, five minutes down the road as well. There will probably be some students in some of these uh, in some of these uh, units here, but uh, it is fairly close to a lot of amenities. A lot of Canadian Tire is there, so it's in a well-established neighborhood with a lot of uh, amenities and a lot of uh, services. What's the uh, what's the parking demand situation like on Secord Avenue? Well, I think the majority of the houses, the majority of buildings there do have parking, uh, but there are uh, there are uh, one or two of the buildings that don't have parking at all. You're saying that one of the one of the semis beside your property doesn't have any any supplied parking? That's correct. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. 
and that's the one immediately to the left? I believe it is, yes. Okay. okay. Questions, comments from the other panel members on this application? No. Um, you understand uh, <clears throat> the conditions, Mr. Mr. Segreto? Cash and Louvre Parkland, a tree information report, a tree planting plan, existing dwelling removed, servicing plan, accessory structure demolished and or relocated, greening and drainage plan, notice on title noise due to nearby Beechburg Railway. Is that railway line even functioning anymore? I don't know, uh, Mr. Chair. I don't know if it is or not, I'm not sure. I know they did a couple of high rises not too far from where we are, and I, I don't know if it is or not. I, I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, joint use and maintenance agreement is also being required. Yeah. A, uh, either a noise attenuation study or a design unit stay at Central Air with notice on title of environmental issues. Yeah. Environmental noise. Um, Bell wants a, a 2.4 meter easement. That's fine. Aware of that as well. Uh, the right away people are saying that a private approach permit is required for any new relocated or widened driveway, which you're not going to have. No driveways. Um, hydro, if an electrical supply is required for new created parcels of land, the property owners will be required to cover all expenses. Mm -hmm. I think Ms. McLean had an additional condition. Do you want to do I'd impose? just like to add on the consent application that the uh, that the minor variance uh, applications be approved. Okay, we have uh, there has been some opposition to this. I'm assuming that you've been you've met with the neighbors, Mr. Segreto. We have. We sent out a flyer and we had uh, uh, communications uh, uh, via email and uh, the Heron Park Association. Uh, we we did have. Uh, dialogue between us and letters back and forth. We have. And that resulted in? Well, basically they were not in favor and uh, they seem to think it's gonna be a rooming house and uh, they're opposed to the, uh, the proposal. But you know, what we're dealing with here today are minor, minor variances and a, and, a, and a consent. We're not dealing with, we're not dealing with use. That's correct. And the variances to the bylaw. Okay, thank you, Mr. Segreto. Um, now, from Heron Park Community Association, I have two speakers on the list. Um, Susan Carbone, is she there? And Linda Gamma Pinto as well. I'm here. I'm Susan. All right. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Can I have your yeah. address in the record? 10, 1026 Greg Street. 1026 Greg. Okay. All right. Your, uh, your concerns and um, so, comments, please. Yeah. So um, first of all, um, I'm the president of the uh, community association for Heron okay. Park. And okay. I don't, uh, we did not receive any letter from the applicant. Uh, to my knowledge, I, I, I'm the president. I didn't receive anything from him with respect to this um, application. Um, so you received our uh, thorough comments, uh, written comments that we've provided. And I just like to make uh, three points in addition to those. Um, they're, they're bigger and broader than I think uh, what is typically considered when um, looking at these types of applications and they deal with um, how the, this type of building doesn't actually support the goals and objectives of the official plan, um, especially when we're uh, talking about the cross-cutting issues found on 2.24 uh, of the uh, new official plan which deals with healthy and inclusive communities. Um, so, in our view, the official plan is meant to be a tool to anticipate change and manage growth. And section 2.24 states very clearly how the built environment has an influence on the range of health conditions uh, with significant effects on the quality of life and well being. And it talks about that section talks about um, policy intent 
And it talks about 15 minute communities, health supportive and accessible and inclusive communities and designs, how master plans, local plans um, help to strengthen neighborhoods and uh, considering the health implications associated with housing, recognizing the interdependencies between health and the built environment. Um, that's all quoted directly out of the official plan. So the Heron Park community has seen several um, of these types of buildings approved by the committee um, in the past couple of years. Um, and we've been told by the committee that each individual application is um, considered on its own merit. Um, but what tends to happen now, and this applicant has done the same thing, is that they point to the same, they point to those buildings and um, the outcome. Um, so they point to those buildings as saying, you know, that this is what the types of buildings that are actually uh, in the, that particular neighborhood. Um, but but what, what isn't taken into consideration is the impact of the building. And that serves directly towards the official plan in terms of if you're building a certain type of dwelling and the use of the dwelling, the variances that are being asked for actually allow for a larger building, which allows for developers to maximize the building imprint and to put many, um, uh, to increase densification, which is beyond um, beyond reasonable and beyond what supports uh, health and well-being in our community. Also, it, it deals, um, if you look at the official plan, it talks about affordability and affordable rental units in Ottawa. And by, by, applying, uh, by applying, the developer is able to build um, a bigger building and these types of buildings that are currently there, the, the other two that are currently there, are, make, are earning over $5,200 per month per semi base, based on um, four bedrooms at the, the, in the main unit and four bedrooms in the secondary unit. And so in terms of affordability, you'd have to be earning $100,000 per year in order to afford to rent that uh, four bedroom unit. So that doesn't speak to the official plan with respect to uh, creating affordable um, units. And thirdly, the, it doesn't necessarily, the application, how do I phrase this? We had an interim control bylaw, although that's no longer in force, and the R4 zoning review that demonstrated that there was um, urgent concerns with this kind of housing and that that, that those bylaws were put in place uh, intended to control the proliferation of them. And so the committee's approval of similar applications has resulted in these semi-detached dwellings with secondary units that house 16 plus unrelated adults. And as a community association and in representing the neighbors uh, beside it, um, it's, it's not minor. It, the impact and the outcome of, um, of the variance creates a building that has uh, serious negative effects uh, on the community. And one of it is parking. And you saw a picture um, that the applicant had showed of the individual house that's being demolished. And right beside it to the right was a, uh, a, one of the newer buildings that have been um, put up with, without any parking allowed. And yet there are two cars in the photograph parked on the front lawn. And that's, that's the type of thing that tends to happen with these types of buildings. The other thing that happens is the people park on the street. So if you go up that street, every other dwelling, except the ones that have been approved by the committee for variances, have uh, adequate parking and you don't see parking on the street. In front of these, three buildings that are there, there's a considerable number of cars parked on the street so that neighbors can't get out, uh, other neighbors can't get out of their driveways, especially in the winter. So, it, so we don't support this application. We don't think that it speaks, if you look at the official plan fr from a holistic viewpoint, we don't think that it, it, it 
that uh, supports the official plan with respect to health and well-being and affordability. In fact, we think that it detracts and takes away from affordable housing in the community. And what we do support is um, intensification, reasonable gradual intensification that still provides an opportunity um, for people to rent units um, that are affordable, uh, where families, um, I think the other piece of the official plan was to create housing for all um, throughout the lifespan. And it specifically mentions children and older adults. And this, is the, this isn't the type of housing that does that. Um, so we don't support the applications uh, submitted. We don't support rewarding developers for pushing the envelope uh, for their own gain at the expense of the well-being of the community. And we implore you as a committee um, to consider the unintended but foreseeable consequences of approving these variances that may seem minor on, on paper, but have uh, the results of them are not minor. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Carbone, um, out of curiosity on Secord Avenue, uh, what kind of parking restrictions, if any, are there? They have just the regular parking uh, restrictions that um, are, you know, Monday or sorry, Monday to Friday from seven to uh, seven is three hour period. And Saturdays, it's a six hour period. So those are the regular city parking where they don't uh, post signs. So parking, parking overnight is therefore allowed. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I live in a neighborhood where we had a problem like this in the past and we got guest permit parking on my street and a number of others. Yes. Uh, and our community. Oh, sorry. Finish. And uh, quite frankly, that's one way to resolve your, your parking issues because multi-residential units don't qualify. Yes. And, and uh, over the past two years, we have been working with our city councilor to try to get one-sided parking um, so that uh, at least there's a flow of traffic um, and it, as well, um, but what we're finding is in the winter time, it's particularly uh, bad because of the uh, weaving in and out of cars and the snow banks that are left uh, narrow the streets and these are streets that don't have sidewalks. And so uh, we just, uh, we, we've just heard from the city that we, I don't know, I don't qualify. Uh, we went through a long process with the community. We did surveys, we did a petition uh, from the city. And um, unfortunately we don't have sufficient numbers to support the city changing based on their uh, policy for changing the parking restrictions on a street. Well, it used um, to be at the city of Ottawa had a road, minimum road width and it's anything under 7.5 meters of paved surface, parking only on one side. So anyway, we di we digress or I digress from the uh, so you from the uh, from the application before us. That's something you may want to you might, may want to take up with the infrastructure people. Definitely, um, thank you. Yep, yeah. and road width for parking on two sides. So it's really not an issue. If it's not allowed, it's not allowed, and the signs go up and parking goes on one side of the street only. Then you're going to have a fight over who, who wants the which, parking on their side of the street. Which side? I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly yeah. right. We've yep. heard it. Been there and done that. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your input. I also have, um, we also have uh, Ms. Gamma Pinto on, uh, yes. on the speaker's list. Is she there? Yes, I am. Thank you very can much. I get, uh, can I get your address for yes. the record, please? My address is 1542 Jill Street here in Heron Park. Okay. You're, uh, please, uh, and I am, comments, uh, yes, I'm the vice president of the Heron Park Community Association. Okay. Um, I, I'd just like to supplement um, my neighbor's um, um, comments. Um, mm -hmm. I've been in the neighborhood for over 35 years, so I have a little bit more uh, background with respect to some of the properties on Seacord. Um, 1055 A and B were the first uh, uh, semis. 
uh, to be built on a single, um, on what had been a single family um, detached lot. And uh, at that, that, those buildings have uh, four bedrooms, no secondary units, and they have driveways. So um, in our neighborhood, and uh, R3A zone, we have numerous um, triplexes, duplexes, and semis. These, uh, the semis at 1055A uh, do fit our lot fabric and um, um, uh, the style and character of the neighborhood. Uh, they were owner occupied um, with families. They are now currently, one side is occupied by a family, the other is occupied by four, four uh, individuals who are able to park their cars, their four cars in the laneway. The subsequent um, uh, bills, 1045 and 1053, um, used that, that um, uh, precedent of 1055 to uh, argue that their semis uh, also fit the lot size and fabric. However, um, they added the secondary dwelling units. So what we have are buildings with excessive bedroom counts. The two semis, uh, these four units, the two semis on uh, 1045 and the two semis at 1053 contain a total of 16 bedrooms in each, um, in each unit. They really are much more, uh, can, could be much more considered uh, fourplexes as opposed to semi-detached with secondary units. Neither of these two buildings, um, as uh, Mr. Segreto noted, uh, have parking. And the overflow and the impact on the neighbors is quite dramatic. Um, as you, as uh, Mr. Segreto uh, indicates, yes, we are well served by transit, but that doesn't mean that people don't own cars. I myself um, have worked in about eight different uh, federal departments and I have never needed my car uh, to get to work, use my bike or transit, but I own a car and I have a driveway in which I park it and I use it for you know, various and sundry uses. Um, in the, uh, the, the R4 review, the city recognized um, as extremely problematic excessive bedroom uh, count buildings. Uh, this, this proposed building will add to the two other on either side and will dominate and overwhelm the homes around it. This mass is made even more impactful by the undersized lot and the force into the building envelopes. Please note, we're not saying that the developer cannot uh, develop the lot. We're not saying you can't intensify. Certainly a, a, a semi-detached is welcome. But it is really the, the expansion of the envelope to allow this enormous bedroom count that is what is really the rub here. Um, and, you know, again, the use of the precedence of the other, other buildings um, it really detracts from our neighborhood and is creating tremendous, tremendous challenges. The purpose of the R3A zoning and the zoning bylaw is to permit a mix of residential building forms, ranging as we know from detached to townhouse dwellings in this area, um, as, well, as well to regulate the development in a manner that is compatible with existing land use patterns so that the mixed dwelling residential character of the neighborhood is maintained and enhanced. I cannot say, and many of the neighbors would agree, that this contribution, this building, this proposed building, as well as the other two that are used as examples to um, encourage your, uh, your, uh, your agreement to, to this minor variance, enhance or maintain the residential character of our neighborhood. Um, so then what, what is the vision of the bylaw? What, what could we propose for this, this area? And what we would think is why not a, a townhouse? A townhouse, uh, two townhouses beside one another on this lot would not require any variances to fit. And it would, uh, may even mean that it's affordable for a family. Um, as long as the, the, as long as maximum profit is the driver for intensification and not the policy intent of the official plan strategic direction on building livable communities, nor the bylaws focus on appropriate land use community sustainability and residential character 
the negative externalities of these end use buildings, and they are end use because there is no storage that a family could, uh, could, that could be adapted to other uses. These end use buildings will continue to flow and include the erosion of affordability and family appropriate housing. I don't believe, and we don't believe that this application for variance meets the four tests of minor variance. It is not minor. It is not desirable for the appropriate development or use of the land. It is not in keeping with the general intent and purpose of zoning bylaw, nor the official plan. Finally, I'd just like to address Mr. Segreto's uh, comment that he has con uh, consulted with the community association. We received no letter. He has, uh, the letters were distributed to the neighbors in the uh, consult, in the, you know, the 600 meter circle. Uh, he did not uh, contact our community, the, the um, ward counselor to get in contact with the community association which has been the, the normal method that other developers have used to reach out to the association itself. And it's not, so, a, requirement. <laughs> and it's not a requirement for our hearing. It may not be a requirement. It isn't but, uh, a requirement. It isn't a requirement for your hearing, but the fact that he indicated that he had, he had not. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Segreto in response. I disagree with that. I don't have the letter in front of me, but I do have emails. I had sent emails out to the Heron Park Association and I can forward those emails to the committee. It may have not gotten to them, but as you know, Mr. Chair, I always do that and I try my very best to always communicate with the community associations. And we did send emails out and I do have correspondence. May have not been to these two women in front of you, but I will forward them to the committee. And we did distribute a flyer. It was in, uh, in our presentation as well that we did try to get a hold of the community as best we could. I'm sorry that we didn't get a hold of them, but I did talk to some other neighbors or some other people from that community association. And as to the uh, objections to, the, to what, you're, what you're proposing for the site from the uh, community association? I'm sorry. As to the objections to the uh, to, to the to your proposal from the that you heard from the community association, all I can all I can say, Mr. Chair, is, is that I have a proposal in front of you that my client has asked me to do, and I am asking for lot width. I'm asking for lot area. It is not something that I'm doing that's any different than any other application. I understand every application is dealt on its own on its own merit, and I believe that what we're providing here is we're providing a good development for this particular uh, site. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Segreto. Ms. McLean, comment, question? Uh, Mr. Chair, can we just hear from the city planner uh, regarding um, bedroom counts, whether there is a restriction on bedroom counts for semi-detached and for secondary dwelling units? Yeah. Mr. Hamilton? Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I do not believe so in this case. Uh, the secondary dwelling units in particular would not be restricted because they have um, no density implications. It would just be for the semi-detached dwellings. So you can have as many bedrooms in a semi-detached and in a secondary dwelling unit. That seems to be the crux of the of the um, community associations is that they're becoming rooming units. So. When does the semi become a rooming unit or? Right. Um, I believe, I, I can't recall off the top of my head. I, I can look at it and get back to you shortly if that works. Well, no, I, it's just, um, I think that that's, that's a, 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 a major concern of, of the community. But before the committee is a semi-detached and I, Assuming you can have as many bedrooms in a semi-detached and it's still deemed to be a semi-detached. Um, so I'm just going, and the parking, there's no requirement for parking. So if there is front yard parking going on neighboring lots and the city has a mechanism to deal with uh, illegal parking, I, I gather on that, uh, um, if there's a complaint lodge. So um, I'll just leave it there, thank you. Okay, all right, okay. I'd like to thank everyone for their input. Um, I think Could I make uh, one, one final comment very, very quickly? Briefly, please. Yes, the comment that Ms. McLean made about the one-sided parking and the complaints to uh, that are being made to the um, 
uh, for service requests to bylaw with okay. these kinds of infractions. Um, uh, we, uh, I've been dealing with the front yard parking at the, uh, the uh, property beside this application for the last uh, year with respect to one's uh, front yard parking and um, it's not been resolved as of yet. Okay. This, is our this is our frustration as a community uh, organization. Yeah, I can understand that. <clears throat> I think what we'll do is uh, given the comments that have come in in support and in opposition, or the support from, obviously from the applicant, uh, we'll reserve on this and uh, the uh, notice of decision will be sent out in 10 days. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Next application we'll hear today is item 10 on the agenda, 390 Bronson Avenue and 239 Cambridge Street North. It's a consent to subdivide the property into two separate parcels of land. Application indicates that these lots are previously separate parcels and have since merged. Um, <clears throat> there was a, uh, from the planning department report on January 31st, uh, we know that there were a, there's a change to the, uh, to the public notice. Uh, the parcel will, or the parcel contains the legally non-complying as amended duplex dwelling and will be known municipally as 239 Cambridge Street North. One of the members is questioning whether or not this, uh, this property is actually a duplex and not, and not a triplex because we seem to remember that it was originally described as a triplex. So has there been a change here? I, no, I believe it is still a triplex and has been for quite some it, time. I'm not I'm sure asking the planner, ma'am. Hang on. Ms. Pekula? Yes, Mr. Chair. So the notice was given for the duplex and the current triplex exists on two lots, which cannot be considered a triplex. So that's why upon conversation with senior planning staff, it was yeah. confirmed that it's... Uh, uh, legally non-compliant duplex because it was established before uh, uh, introduction of zoning bylaw in 1962 and zoning bylaw was established was introduced in 1964. So and we're correct in the in our description of the property as a duplex. I believe so. Mr. Okay. Chair. So we have uh, Ms. Martins, who's going to use the agent for the applicant. Yes, Your address for the, for the record, please. My address is 5897 Fernbank Road in Stittsville. Okay. Okay. And very briefly, your uh, business is back before us for the second time, I believe. Yes. Your, uh, your, uh, can you make your presentation. Uh, Mr. Chair, please administer. Oh, yes, note. that's right. Sorry. Thank you. The oath or declaration. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee? was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time. Yes, I swear. Okay, sorry about that, please proceed. Okay, uh, the intent of this application is to recreate the original rear yard lot line between 390 Bronson and 39 Cambridge. Uh, it's quite a simple application. The lot line historically was there and in alignment with the rest of the neighborhood. Uh, and a previous owner had owned both of the properties and the properties had merged. So the current owner would just like to reestablish that lot line. Okay. All right. That is pretty simple. Yes. Now that we have all the confusion out of the way. Yes. Um, you're aware of the conditions? Yes, I am. Roof of independent storm sanitary and water services uh, convey frontage for right away on Bronson Avenue. Yes. You're okay with that one? Yes, we're fine with it. Uh, okay, and the conditions are essentially the same as the last time around. Unfortunately, the owner has not been able to get a contractor to do the uh, yeah. uh, pipe amendment. So. Okay. And the notice on title of noise due to nearby Bronson Avenue. Right. Okay. All right. Any questions or comments from the uh, other members of the panel regarding this consent? No. 
All in favor of granting the consent as provided to us. Your consent is approved. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Next application that we'll deal with today, items 12 and 13, 256 St. Denis Street. Uh, consent to subdivide the property into two separate parcels of land, proposed to construct two new two-story dwellings, each containing six stacked dwellings with one building on each of the newly created parcels of land, and minor variants in an accessory structure, a garbage enclosure, to be located on a lot other than that of the principal use to which it is an accessory. Um, I think there were some, some questions I think we need to raise with, uh, with the planning department before we begin, begin the discussion on this. Um, Mr. Hamilton, is there a, will there be a, a need for right-of-ways or easements on this property? I do believe so, but I think they will be addressed through the site plan control process. That's your site plan, okay. And a corresponding variance for, off, for an offsite structure. Perhaps Ms. McLean would like to explain that to Mr. Hamilton, since she's seen these before. <laughs> I just, just wanted, um... Uh, to clarify the minor variance application, um, typically we, we could see two minor variance applications, one for each property where the accessory building is located on the property. It's, um, it's as filed um, to permit it to be accessory to another, uh, another uh, property. And then on the property that doesn't have the accessory building, there would be a minor variance to permit the waste facility to be located off site. And I don't see that, but I, I'm not sure if it's needed. So I just wanted to, to, to seek some clarification from you on that. Certainly through you, Mr. Chair, from a staff perspective, the way that the minor variance was organized that uh, was that the minor variance was applied to the property that does not contain the accessory structure. Um, and relies on the accessory structure of the other property. From this perspective, staff are satisfied that it does meet our intent oftentimes, and I do understand your, your comment, oftentimes we have sort of conflicting or redundant policies in the zoning bylaw where we have to vary from both of them. Um, in this case, uh, I believe staff are satisfied that the way that the minor variances are organized do or are, are satisfactory. Okay, thank you. It's just that there's no guarantee that these will always be uh, owned by the same entity. Um, and so if they were um, owned by different owners down the line, um, that's where I wondered if you needed a variance for both both uh, lots. But um, thank you for, for that. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, Agent for the applicant is uh, Mr. Sutherland. Is he there? Yep. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Nick Sutherland your address, here. Your address for the record, please, Mr. Sutherland. It's uh, 396 Cooper Street, Suite 300. And before we begin the all the solemn declaration, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing? Including visible and legible during the entirety of that time. I do swear, yes. All right, please proceed. All right, so I have a brief presentation prepared just to go run you through the development application. Thank you. So, again, uh, my name is Nick Sutherland. I'm a planner with Foten Planning and Design today, representing Guignol Non. Profit Housing Corporation as an agent for their application. Um, Gignol is a nonprofit housing provider in the city of Ottawa and has been for a number of years. Um, they focus with their clientele who are Aboriginal members of the community who are currently at risk of losing housing or who don't currently have housing. Um, if you want to proceed to the next slide, please. So just a bit of a, a development summary here on the right is an image of the site plan. 
Um, so we're also going through a site plan control application uh, in parallel with these committee of adjustment applications. Um, there was previously a single detached dwelling on this property that was unfortunately destroyed by fire in 2020. Uh, the, it was subsequently demolished in early 2021 uh, by order of the Building uh, Services Department. Um, and currently, Guignol is seeking to replace these dwelling units, but also to, you know, take the opportunity to redevelop the property and, and add some more housing to their stock. Um, so what's currently proposed is two stacked dwellings with six units per dwelling, um, one on each half of the lot. Uh, both of these dwellings are completely compliant with the zoning performance standards, including setbacks, height, uh, lot coverage, width, etc. Um, currently, we're not proposing any vehicle parking, and that's both a function of the zoning requirement, which doesn't request any, but also um, King Yol's own clients who don't necessarily always require a vehicle. And so we decided to uh, forego the parking space in the rear yard. As you can see, though, there is a multi-purpose space, which has a function of potentially accommodating drop-offs, um, pickups, deliveries, or any kind of move-ins and things like that, but can also be re repurposed as a, a rear yard amenity space. Um, and you'll see as well right next to it in the bottom right corner of that site plan an amenity space is located there for use by the residents. And then the waste enclosure kind of on the left side, which is actually built into a portion of the property that is quite steep. There's a bit of a grade towards the rear there. And so there are retaining walls required in order to sort of make all of this function in the rear yard. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Guignol is seeking to operate both of these buildings as one effectively. The residents will be served by Guignol and, and essentially the logistics and functioning of the site will be uh, as one. And that's both a matter of convenience for Guignol, but also a cost effectiveness in terms of providing services for the residents. Uh, and so effectively, in order to proceed with the development, it was made, a uh, decision was made to go for a severance in order to create two lots rather than have the one. Um, and consequently, we do have to apply for a minor variance because of this technical aspect in the bylaw for accessory structures. So uh, per section 551A of the bylaw, the, an accessory structure, in this case, a garbage enclosure, is required to be on the same lot as the principal building it serves. Uh, and so, of course, as I mentioned, we're going to be, or Guignol will be operating the site as one. And so in order to permit residents from the building on the right-hand side to access the uh, garbage enclosure on the left-hand side, we legally have to proceed with a variance in order to permit that scenario. Um, and as I mentioned, there is an ongoing site plan control application. Uh, we've had some great support from staff and housing services and uh, development review. A uh, big thank you to Jenny Kluke and Shauna Turkington who helped with this uh, process. And so a lot of the other site design matters are being dealt with through that process individually. How, how far along are you in the site plan application? Um, we are quite far along. We've received comments from staff for our second review and have subsequently responded to them. So we're basically tying up loose ends in, in that respect and also waiting for the outcome of these applications with the committee. So, uh, so the committee can uh, can expect that uh, you won't be back before us with further variance requests on this application on this property. Absolutely, Mr. Chair. Yeah. All right. Okay. Please proceed. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you a bit of an idea of how it kind of breaks down in terms of the severance and the parts that are going to be proposed for the development, you can see here uh, the two stacked dwellings, one on each side. The severance is proposed right down the middle. And as I mentioned before, both lots are fully compliant with zoning in terms of lot area, width, um, and other performance standards. So there are um, parts here that will be needed to be addressed through an easement that's uh, being prepared through a lawyer to address this. Um, parts two and five, as you can see, split the driveway, and so access will be needed to be given for uh, residents on both sides to access. Um, but also for part three, which is the garbage enclosure at the rear, part six is the multi-purpose space, and that back end of part five there would be the amenity area. So that joint use and maintenance agreement is just going to allow permissions for residents to use amenities and uh, functional elements on both sides, as well as access the street uh, from the rear of the property. Next slide, please. We did have some questions in terms of the tree conservation, and I know this is something that's being touched on quite a bit in the new official plan. So I did want to highlight the fact that there are trees being removed as part of the development, um, but there are a few that are being retained. And in fact, most of the removed trees are in fair to poor condition, as you can see in the tree inventory and assessment on the right. Um, there's also the four trees being retained are 
some of the larger trees and healthier ones. Um, but of course, because of the site, the way that it's built into the grade of the hill, uh, there is going to have to be some removal there in order to fit that stack dwelling on the left hand side in. Next uh, slide, please. Some site photos here just to kind of give you an idea of what is existing in terms of those trees. The conditions are not necessarily great. Um, there's a little bit of garbage back there and it's not necessarily a well planned out um, in, in terms of its vegetation and landscaping. Next slide. So what we're trying to do is not only improve upon that, but there will be the removal of some of these more damaged trees that is supposed to help with, you know, uh, keeping everyone safe in particular because there is a public pathway right on the left side. Uh, reaching up to Tabor Avenue. So, um, you know, in coordination with our landscape team and the architect, there is some significant improvements. And if you go to the next slide, I can show you some of those. Some more shots here of the understory growth. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, the landscape plan. And as you can see, um, not only in the rear yard, but along the front of the property as well, there's gonna be the addition of several street trees, um, some new landscaping elements that are gonna really beautify the streetscape. Previously, it was one dwelling with a pretty large surface parking area on the right-hand side of the property. Um, but as well, you can see in the rear yard, not only are there retained trees, but there's also several proposed trees and plantings, a large shrub or hedge along the back of the property line for some additional screening and privacy. And of course, um, the retaining walls that I had mentioned previously are all engineered uh, in order to, to control the grades, but also to create a, a nicer landscape in the rear yard. Next slide, please. So finally, getting into some of the policy here, I won't delve too into this too much, but uh, our project effectively meets Section 53 of the Planning Act with regards to consents to sever. Um, we're also meeting the policies of the City of Ottawa's existing official plan in terms of the general urban area and uh, low rise development. So we are intensifying a site that has access to transit not too far um, with um, a development that is in keeping with the character of the neighborhood, examples of built form that are found on the street and in other areas of Vanier. Uh, and similarly, in the new City of Ottawa official plan within the neighborhood designation, we do meet a lot of the same policies and the same policy directions in terms of providing a low rise, affordable dwelling units in an area that is uh, well served by transit and well served by amenities with those on Montreal Road not too far away. And finally, the zoning bylaw, we do still meet the intent of the zoning bylaw. As I mentioned, all the other performance standards in terms of setbacks, lot width and area are met. It's simply the matter of the definition of the accessory structure and where it can be located um, that is requiring us to request this variance today. I can get into some additional policy discussion and the tests and all that if you like, or we can get right into some questions and comments. I see Mr. Waldman has a hand up. Well, if you could just articulate how this meets the four tests. Then we can uh, sure thing. Yep. continue. So in terms of whether or not it meets the intents of the official plan, as I just mentioned, it is a development that is in a general urban area in the existing plan and in the neighborhood designation within the new official plan. Um, it is a low rise multi-unit building compatible with existing context and plan function. Um, the proposed stack dwellings are an example of a housing form that's appropriate and existing in the neighborhood, achieving the goals and compatible intensification. And the request variance facilitates the function and operation of this site, um, including the shared amenities in the rear yard. So in terms of the, the new official plan, it's very similar in the same regard. A lot of the policies are being met. Um, it's a low rise stack dwelling in conformity with the neighborhood designation within the ur inner urban transit area, which has been designated for intensification. Um, we're also supporting the transit network, as I mentioned, with local transit available on Marier and on Montreal Road, very close by. Um, in terms of maintaining the intended purpose of the zoning bylaw, as I did say, the compliance um, is throughout all of the performance standards for the R4UA zone. Um, there is no uh, abutting impacts or additional height to reduce setbacks that would, that would necessarily have any negative impacts to neighbors. Um, in terms of whether it is an appropriate development for the use of the lands, um, there was a pre-existing dwelling on this property that was low rise. We're effectively creating uh, two lots now, both of which that are compliant for low rise. Um, and it does make an efficient use of the land, recognizing that there are some topography constraints and some physical constraints to how we can design it. 
Again, this variance helps us achieve that in a more cost-effective way and in a more functional manner for Guignol as they operate the site into the future for their residents. And finally, the proposal is minor in nature. As I mentioned, the requested variance does not have any impacts to any of the neighbors. There's no performance standards that are being reduced. Um, effectively, we're simply asking for uh, a permission to go in a slightly different direction than the zoning bylaw would prescribe us to. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Mr. Wildman, you had a question or comment? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, actually, for Ms. Young uh, first, um, just in keeping with uh, the comments we made earlier about how we operationalize these conditions, uh, if we were to say something along the lines for condition three, that the grading plan shall demonstrate that the proposed structures have the least impact uh, on the protected trees and tree cover to the satisfaction of the general manager, um, you wouldn't have a problem uh, with that sort of rearranging of, of that wording? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I don't believe that I had a condition on this one because um, really all the conditions will be dealt with through the site plan. Oh, um, well, we have one showing. I think I think, I think oh. they're deleted. They're deleted? Okay, well, there's so, the version. Hamilton, the version. The, the, all the conditions are deleted for this? Are they all Apologies. deleted? Apologies, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, there were initially three conditions and one for cash okay. uh, in lieu of parkland and two tree conditions, and they were removed because they would okay. be dealt with at the site plan. All right. Okay. And that, that's fine. That makes good sense. Um, but and, you're still uh, asking the question, Mr. Wild. Well, I, I think in the future, if I could just you know do my plug for that. Uh, sorry about the confusion. Yep. Um, and uh, Mr. Hamilton, while you're there on these orders, um, we'll where do these stand? Do you, Mr. Chair, I may, I may need to confirm with the applicant. I, I'm not certain that they are applicable anymore. Uh, Mr. Sutherland, do you have any? Correct. Yes. Ahead? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I believe the building code services orders were for the demolition post fire, um, which has since occurred. And there was also a few other conditions in there about the site itself, which have also been addressed um, in the past year. So they've been cleared? I believe so, yes. Yeah, presumably before you get a building permit, if there were any outstanding orders, they would be addressed, but uh, you believe that they're, that they're, they've been addressed. Okay. Um, in that case, I don't, I don't have any other questions, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. McLean, you questioned your comments. I would just add a condition on the consent that the minor variance applications be approved. That's sort of a standard, uh, condition and um, just a question to planning staff. Uh, um, can you take cash and lose through site plan control approval? I just wondered about that. Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe so for this uh, development in particular, it wouldn't be applicable as they are a nonprofit housing group. Okay. Anything else, Ms. McLean? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. So the We've added a condition that Ms. McLean just articulated. We've removed the first, the three that we had. The planning department doesn't say that, that says we don't need them anymore. Uh, you're aware of Hydro's comments regarding yes. uh, electrical supply required for the new parcels. Yep. You're, you're also aware of the right of way people and private approach permit for any new relocated or widened driveway. Yes. So that would be between the two buildings, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. You're not providing parking, but it could be used. It can be used for drop offs and pickups. Correct. Back space. Okay. All right. The site plan application is just about complete. So you won't be coming back to us with any further variance requests. Correct. And I think we've can, we've straightened out the, uh, the, uh, accessory building on the other lot issue. The department seems to be quite content to leave the things as they are. Um, any other questions from the members? No? Prepare to vote on this application to uh, for 256 St. Denis Street regarding the consent and the variances. All in favor? Good luck with your project. Your application is approved. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, panel members. Thank you. You're welcome.
item on the agenda is item 14. 4008 Shirley Avenue. This is a return application. It was uh, adjourned for a while to get some clarification. Minor variances to permit reduced setbacks in the Rideau River proposed to construct an, excuse me, an entry hall at the front of the detached dwelling, rebuild the second level of the southern wing of the dwelling, and replace the deck canopy with uncovered balcony at the rear water side of the dwelling. And the um, Agent for this application is Mr. West. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Mr. West, for your for the uh, for the record, your your uh, address, please. My address is two forty Michael Copeland, Suite two hundred. Okay. We'll do the oath or solemn declaration. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee? was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing, and clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time. Mr. Chair, this is Mr. Oh, you swear, okay. No, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, I'll defer that to Mr. Simmons, who's on the call. All right, Mr. Simmons, you heard, I just read it out. Yes, I heard it, and uh, as I just uh, blurted out, yes, I so swear. Okay, are you gonna be making the presentation, Mr. Simmons? Or Mr. No, West. I'm leaving that to Mr. West. Okay. All right. Please proceed, Mr. West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just wait till it's up. Perfect. So the applications that are in front of you this afternoon are minor variance applications on the property municipally known as 4008 Shirley Avenue. The context of the subject property is shown in the image in front of you. Uh, it's located in ward number 22. It's on the west side of Shirley Avenue. Uh, it has frontage on the Rideau River. Uh, you, on the image in front of you, you can see the intersection of Lime Bank Road and Earl Armstrong Road sort of on the right side, uh, as well as the parallel roads of Prince of Wales Drives and River Road. Switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the image in front of you shows the existing conditions on the site. There's an existing detached dwelling on the subject property. Uh, in general, the lots on the west side of Shirley Avenue are all located quite close to the Rideau River. Uh, the subject property has an area of 1,485 meters squared uh, with 40 meters of frontage along Shirley Avenue. Switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. The slide in front of you is showing the draft reference plan for the subject property. The proposed applications for minor variants facilitate an, an addi addition adjacent to Shirley Avenue, uh, renovations as well as a balcony to the existing detached dwelling. The proposal entails increasing the height of the existing building from one and a half stories to two stories. Uh, and the individual driveway provides access from Shirley Avenue to the existing garage. Switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. The image in front of you is a more zoomed in version of the site plan. Uh, the dark gray represents the existing dwelling. And I would note that the Rideau River is located to the bottom of, of the page uh, south of west, sorry, the existing detached dwelling. The 30 meters setback from the normal high water mark of the Rideau River is shown as the blue line on the image in front of you. Uh, at the front of the house, there's the proposed two-story addition, which is shown with a red hatching. And the pro, uh, proposed renovations uh, to increase the height of the existing building are shown over the existing building in the red hatching. Uh, the existing deck uh, to be removed is shown in green on the image in front of you. And the proposed deck is shown in red. Uh, and one thing to note on this drawing in front of you is that the proposed deck will be located further away from the water than the existing deck. Um, let me switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. The slide in front of you highlights the, uh, the required variances. Uh, all of the variances relate to the proximity of the proposed development being within 30 meters of the normal high water mark of the Rideau River. 
uh, the proposed development in general is located further away or in the same place as the existing dwelling um, to the Rideau River. Um, I'd just like to point out that the applications for variances have been circulated to City of Ottawa planning staff, as well as the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority for comment. I would note that city staff have no concerns uh, to the proposed minor variances and that Rideau Valley Conservation Authority staff have no objections to the proposed minor variance. Uh, it's my understanding that our client has been in discussion with the RVCA throughout the design of the proposed development and the RVCA are simply waiting on the results of the minor variance application to proceed with the CA permit. Okay, so switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. So with respect to the first test uh, for minor variances, um, I'll, I'll speak to the section of the official plan that details the setbacks from uh, normal high watermarks, the section uh, 4.7.3, and it states that, quote, ensuring the development is set back an appropriate distance from water courses helps serve these purposes by ensuring a healthy natural riparian zone and providing a margin of safety from hazards associated with flooding and unstable slope, slopes. The um, proposed addition uh, will be located on the front facade of the building adjacent to Shirley Avenue and well away from the Rideau River. The proposed renovations to the second story will be located in the same location as the existing building and the proposed balcony uh, will replace the existing deck and will be located further away from the water course. Uh, it's, our, it's our opinion that the requested variances maintain the general intent and purpose of the official plan. If I ask you to switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the requested uh, minor variances facilitate the addition, the renovations in a balcony to an existing detached dwelling, which is a permitted use under the R1 zoning for which applies to this property. I'd also like to note that the proposed development meets the performance standards for lot area, lot width, front yard setback, rear yard setback, interior side yard setback, and building height. Just to switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. The image in front of you shows the front elevations of the, of the proposed development. Uh, the existing second level is to be rebuilt. And on the image in front of you uh, in the black hatching, you can see the existing roof line. So this slide helps to demonstrate the changes to the, uh, to the roof, to the roof uh, of the building. Um, with respect to task number two for general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw, uh, it's section 69 of the zoning bylaw requires that no buildings or parts of buildings are located 30 meters from the normal high water mark of any water course. And sort of as mirrored in the discussion with the official plan, the intent uh, of this provision is to prohibit development um, uh, with respect to impact to shoreline erosion and ensure there are safe distances for, from flood hazards and to also protect water quality from the impacts of proposed development. Um, so, you know, in speaking to the proposed addition, uh, it's located on the front facade of the existing building. And it, as I said previously, it's located far away from the Rideau River. Uh, the proposed addition on the front facade of the building will not cause any shoreline erosion or negatively impact water quality. Uh, with respect to the uh, second story for this building, it will be located over top of the existing building. And similarly, it won't have any, any um, shoreline erosion or negatively impact the water quality. Uh, with respect to the balcony at the rear, the proposed balcony utilizes elements of the existing at-grade deck, and the proposed balcony will be located further from the water than the existing deck and porch roof. Uh, the proposed balcony at the rear of the building will not cause shoreline erosion or negatively impact water quality. Uh, it's our opinion that the variances meet the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw. Switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the third test, which is desirability, um, the proposed minor variances for the addition in the second story, uh, they both increase the total liv livable space of the existing detached dwelling. And the proposed addition at the front uh, is located uh, located at the front of the building, located far, far enough away from the Rideau River. Uh, with respect to the second story, it's located in the exact same place as the existing detached dwelling. 
And with respect to the balcony at the rear, uh, the proposed balcony is located further away from the water course than the existing deck and porch roof. So it's our opinion that the proposed variances are considered desirable. Switch to the next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. The slide in front of you highlights the side of the proposed uh, development from the south. Uh, on this image, the Rito River will be on the left side of your screen. Uh, this image highlights the proposed deck, uh, which is shown in red, uh, will be located above the first story, meaning there's even less potential for flooding than if it was located at grade. Uh, this image further demonstrates the addition that uh, the front of the house has been, has been positioned to be located as far away from the setback to the water course as possible. Switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. With respect to the fourth test, test uh, which is considered minor, uh, the proposed addition is considered minor as it's located as far away from the Rideau River as possible. Uh, it's located approximately the same distance from the Rideau River as the existing garage, and the proposed addition will not impact the slope stability of the shoreline, quality of water. Uh, with respect to the second story addition, we view it as minor as it's located in the same position as the existing detached dwelling. Uh, we would also note that there are no variances required to permit an increased height and the proposed second story will not impact the slope stability, of the shoreline or the quality of the water. Uh, with respect to the proposed balcony, it's our view that it's considered minor as it's been located further from the water course than the existing deck and porch roof. The proposed uncovered balcony is smaller than the existing deck and porch roof with respect to area. And the proposed uh, balcony will not impact the slope stability, of the shoreline or quality of the water when compared to the existing conditions. Fast switch next slide, please. Thank you. The image in front of you shows the uh, existing conditions on the left and the rendering of the proposed development on the right. Um, it's our view that the proposed development has been designed to be consistent with the character of the area and the proposed minor variances will not impact the character of the neighborhood. It's our view that all the variances are considered minor. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. West. Any questions, comments from the members on this application? I note that the uh, Hydro Ottawa has their, um, their standard comments regarding <coughs> construction and notification seven days, seven working days before, which you're, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and as far as the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority is concerned, so you've been in, discuss you're, you've been in discussions with them and they are in agreement with this and uh, I guess what permits will be issued after we approve. That's, that's how this is going to go. I'll let Mr. Lalonde speak to the Conservation Authority's comments. Yeah, if I may, through the chair, uh, Eric Lalonde from the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority. Uh, yes, we've been in, in consultation with the applicants uh, um, quite extensively on this project. At this point, we don't have any objections to the uh, to the variance requested. They they align with the policies that would be required to obtain a permit. Uh, at this point, we're we're as Mr. West had indicated, we're more or less waiting for the uh, committee of adjustment process to be completed before we uh, we complete our review and um, work through the permitting process. So uh, the project as it stands would meet our policies, and uh, therefore we have no objections. Um, but we typically wait till the committee of adjustments completed their work before we do ours. Okay, thank you, Ms. McLean. You had a question or comment? Uh, nothing further, Mr. Chair. Okay, all right. Okay, you ready to uh, make a decision on this? Yeah, all in favor of this application. That's before us today. Good luck with your project. The application is granted. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next application on the agenda, item number 15, 349 and 351 Sherwood Drive. It's a consent to subdivide the property into two separate parcels of land to establish separate ownership for each half of the existing semi-detached dwelling. Uh, this was adjourned the 17th of November and December the 8th. 
last year. Uh, Mr. Jelkatsi, I believe, is the uh, is the agent. Is he there? Yes, you are. Your address for the record, please, Mr. Jelkatsi. 331 Osgood, <coughs> Osgood Street. And do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time? I swear that it was visible and okay. legible. All right. This is, uh, this is the final application for consent? Yes. What's changed from the last time? Uh, nothing has changed. Uh, staff, uh, you can, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, you can confirm with staff, but they had to review it from the perspective of uh, the possibility of other minor variances uh, being required. Um, my understanding is that that's been cleared and that we are um, good to go on the severance as uh, planned. Okay. I believe Ms. McLean had some comments regarding the severance line. Ms. McLean? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, um, I'm just wondering um, why this particular configuration and why not um, uh, do it by way of a right of way. My concern is that we're, we're being asked to create an irregularly shaped uh, parcels of land um, based on accessory buildings that may or may not be there in the future. So um, if we could just um, hear Mr. Jelkowski on that point. Yes, uh, to you, Mr. Chair. Um, there are two things that came into doing the severance this way. There are a number of severances in this immediate neighborhood that have been done in, in a very similar fashion. Um, we have two fairly uh, good garages. Uh, they're in reasonably good shape. Um, they're attached to each other. Um, they were developed as, as a semi-detached on one property with the two garages on a corner lot with the garages having access on the one side of the property. Um, the concern about an easement uh, approach uh, is that we would be creating a parking space on a property that is not accessory uh, to the property that the parking would be uh, put on. Uh, the uh, property is more valuable from the perspective of not having easements in the sense that it is freehold tenure. Um, the jog in the uh, property line was done for two reasons. So if you're looking at the east side of the back of the garage for the property on the west side, they have access to maintain the back of their garage and all three walls. Um, there will have to be a, sh a shared maintenance agreement for the party wall between the garages, which will be similar to the party wall uh, between uh, the two uh, semi-detached units. So it tends to lend itself to a much simpler land tenure and uh, uh, agreement in terms of shared maintenance. Uh, each property owner then has the access to the uh, uh, to their uh, component of the buildings, uh, both the garages and the uh, semi-detached units. The other benefit that we made was that the existing, you'll note that there's an existing deck on the easterly property. Um, the job was made there there's an existing, very substantial, beautiful tree in very, very good health. Um, and we did not also want to create uh, a shared um, ownership circumstance for that tree. Um, we preferred to, and we talked with Nancy about this, um, Nancy Young about this, uh, we preferred to see it being owned by one owner um, and therefore not having to be subject to uh, any kinds of disagreements in that regard. So that's why we came up with this severance line. Uh, thank you. Anything else, Mr. Jelkatsi? Uh, no. Okay. So the severance line takes a jog like that to uh, 
to avoid a shared, creating a shared tree, and number two, to to put uh, to not to, to have accessory parking on the same site. Correct. For each of, for each of the units. Okay. All right. Any further questions from the members of committee? Care to vote on this application? Mr. Wildman? Are you in favor? Okay. I am as well, Ms. Uh, Ms. McLean. I'll be dissenting, Mr. Chair, if there's an approval. Okay. You want to reserve and discuss this? I'll leave it to your, to, it's up to your vote, Mr. Chair, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, I'm in, I'm in favor, Mr. Wildman's in favor. So if you're gonna dissent, you have dissented on this. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sure Ms. McLean's rationale for dissenting will be in the, uh, in, the, in the decision we issue. All right, on a vote of two to one, Mr. Jalkazi, your uh, application is approved. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee. Next application before us are items 16 and 17, 1371 Maxime Street. These are consents, a consent to subdivide a property to two separate parcels of land, proposed to construct two two-story long semi-detached dwellings with secondary units in each unit, and the existing dwelling to be demolished. Minor variances have been, a, have been requested to permit reduced rear yard setbacks and a reduced Lot width, <coughs> excuse me, lot width. And the um, the agent for this application is Mr. Hume. Mr. Hume, are you there? Yes, you are. Yeah, Your man. address for the record, please, Mr. Hume. 2405 San Laurent Boulevard, Unit uh, P. Okay. Not one. And regarding the oath or solemn declaration, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee? was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time. I do. And this was adjourned uh, on, the Jan on January 12th. So if you'd like to uh, proceed, Mr. Hume. Yep. Just Mr. Chairman, I have a brief presentation uh, to the committee. Um, as the chair noted, this is a, uh, a minor variance and consent application for 1371 uh, Maxime Street. You can see in the, in the picture, um, the lot is uh, uh, highlighted in, uh, in turquoise. It's in an R2 end zone, um, which uh, provides uh, a nine meter lot width and uh, for detached duplex and linked detached dwellings, um, nine meters for semi-detached and a 10 meter width for uh, long semi-detached um, units. It's, uh, I measured it at 700 meters to uh, the walk entrance to the pedestrian bridge to the LRT station. Um, the city seems to think it might be a little bit closer than that, 500 meters uh, given their conditions, but um, it is uh, very uh, close. It is in the outer urban uh, transect of the new official plan, and you can see it on your screen as marked in, uh, in orange. Um, so the, uh, and uh, that's important because uh, the OP designation in the outer urban transect is, is neighborhood. And when you look at the uh, official plan, uh, policies within um, that uh, outer urban transect, um, the expectation uh, that the OP gives in this neighborhood is that uh, the proportion of single detached dwellings will shrink um, over time to be with, to be replaced um, with higher density ground oriented housing, similar to the type that is being proposed um, through this development. Um, when you look at the, uh, 
uh, the picture, you can see a number of uh, lots both beside uh, both to the north and to uh, the south of the, the subject property. Um, and they range, uh, if you're on the, the north, same side of the street, but on the north side of, of the property moving sort of uh, down 1367, uh, they range in uh, width from nine meters to 8.05 is the, is the smallest. And you move across the street and there are a number of, of similarly uh, type uh, lot widths. Uh, 9.1 meter, 9.91 meters to uh, 8.98 meters in the surrounding um, in the surrounding neighborhoods, and you can see here is just a smattering of uh, the uh, typology that you see in um, uh, in the surrounding community. Um, top middle, and I guess the top middle picture that you're seeing there, the, the little blue house. That's the, the subject property. Um, you have a single uh, detached dwelling to uh, on the right hand side, another single detached dwelling on the uh, left hand side as you're looking at it. And as you move down the street, you can see you have uh, different typologies. I think that's a triplex with a shared driveway. Um, and then across the street, you're seeing um, a number of singles and, um, and semi detached uh, dwellings. So this is a consent application um, and the consent creates two lots. Um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, the consent application creates two, uh, sorry, did I lose it? Yeah, there we go. Um, so the consent application take, um, contain, creates two lots. Um, Parts uh, seven, eight, nine, and uh, six comprise one lot, and one through five comprise another. There will be reciprocal easements on uh, parts five and six for the driveways leading to uh, the rear parking. Uh, I want to note that the southern lot um, conforms to the, um, the existing zoning, uh, predominantly because Part one is an existing easement um, in favor of the city of Ottawa for infrastructure uh, purposes. So that creates um, a lot of 10.81 meters. Well, the lot to the uh, north is 9.06 uh, meters. Both lots um, exceed the lot area requirement of, uh, of the zoning bylaw. So if we can go to, um, uh, the next slide. So the, the first variance that I just want to, to touch on is uh, the north um, lot, which is uh, 9.07 uh, meter lot width, which is the variance um, that we're seeking for a long semi-detached um, dwelling. As you know, these, these long semis present as, uh, as singles. Uh, when you look at them from the, the street perspective, because there's only one unit uh, facing on to the street using a shared driveway. Um, the zoning bylaw, the intent of the zoning bylaw when uh, it created the 10 meter lot width was it contemplated at the time that these potentially would stand alone. And in those cases, you got a 10 meter lot width with a three meter uh, driveway um, and a seven meter building and side yard. So when you, when you bring that, um, that test to um, these uh, ones that use a shared driveway, you can see that um, you're still meeting the intent of the, of the bylaw um, because you're, you're, you still have um, a, uh, your building and side yard still uh, comprises the majority um, of the lot and where your uh, where the lot width is um, being reduced is in the uh, area of the of the shared driveway. So very consistent with uh, with the intent of uh, of the zoning bylaw uh, in this case. Um, and as you can see, the the variance for 
uh, lot width is only on the northern portion of, uh, of the property. Um, and you can see the easement on, uh, on the rear or on the southern uh, portion um, really starts to set that building quite a, a bit away from, almost three meters away from the, the property line and it's, um, it's an abutting neighbor. Um, so a very large lot in it with very, um, the circumstances have given in some cases some very generous uh, setbacks. If we could go to, um, the, so the next variance that uh, we're looking for, one of the um, is uh, a slight reduction in the rear yard depth. Um, so one of the, the directions in the official plan is to try and create uh, larger uh, units for families. Um, and in, uh, in this case, um, a little bit longer building allows us to create um, a larger three bedroom unit in the, and these aren't large by any, uh, any sense. They're, um, they're about 1500 square feet. Um, but it allows us to make uh, two bedroom secondary dwelling units, which um, are better than, uh, in, in case like this, and better than one bedroom uh, units, larger uh, style, larger footprints. Um, but in the rear yard, there's actually two performance standards. Um, one is the depth, the rear yard uh, depth, and the, the other is the rear yard lot area. Um, in both cases, the lot area provisions are being uh, maintained. So we're meeting the intent of the, the lot area. So what we're looking for is a slight reduction in, uh, in the lot depth. Um, and so when we're trying to ascertain the effect of, of uh, that variance, um, it's clear that one of the, the key effects would be, what does it do to the um, abutting uh, rear yard areas? Um, does it impinge in, uh, in the, those areas um, in uh, an overlook uh, facet? So, you know, what you would look for is you know, when you're standing on the second floor of your house, wherever it is in, in the city, and you look out the window, you can see across to your neighbors and you can see um, to either side, uh, more, more or less. So whether you're a meter closer or a meter further away, that outlook is the same. That's not the same traditionally along the sides. When you can see large, uh, some large windows or some windows where you might have um, overlooked into those abutting uh, rear yard amenity areas. And as you can see, we've, we've designed this building to pull, um, although it's a little longer, uh, it is not we're not placing windows or anything else in those areas that could provide um, that overlook or that um, or impinge upon uh, abutting uh, amenity spaces. So although we're seeking a variance uh, to that, um, it doesn't really affect the uh, the large uh, rear yard area of the of the of the building. We still can provide all the amenities to in that case, and it doesn't provide sort of the, the window overlook to our, uh, our neighbors. So we believe that the impact, the overall impact to that variance is quite, uh, quite minor. And when you look at the Southern property, it's even, even more minor given that you're, three, you're almost three meters off of the uh, Southern property line uh, at the case as a result of the, the requirement to, uh, of, the, uh, of the easement. So, Mr. Chair, we have um, we have four tests that were required um, to meet. Does the does the uh, proposal maintain the general intent and purpose of, of the official plan? Um, in both cases, the uh, the intent of the official plan, um, the old official plan, was to provide um, one of its general intents was an intensification, which which this does. When you look at the new official plan, it's very clear uh, the official plan contemplates uh, this type of development um, within it. Um, it's ground oriented, it's larger family style units. So it, uh, it meets the intent of, of the official plan. I think we've, we've indicated that they, it meets the um, intent of the, the zoning bylaw. 
um, to uh, because of the applicability of the shared uh, driveways. Um, I, I'm sure this is a matter of, uh, of um, a bit of debate, but we believe it's desirable for the uh, development of the property. This is an extremely large lot. Um, we meet all of the other performance standards. Um, so it is appropriate for the development of um, the use of the land. Um, and do we, is the request minor? Um, yes, in, in terms of lot width, the R2 end zone allows for other typologies at nine meters. Um, and the stated, uh, and with the shared driveway, um, you know, the request to, for a nine meter lot width is uh, quite, uh, quite minor. And with respect to the rear yard, um, the rear yard variance, we meet the, uh, the larger or the lot area prescribed um, provision. Um, and the, re the reduction is uh, in, in minor and has very little impact on abutting properties. Mr. Hume, thank you, Mr. Hume. Has there been any discussions with uh, with the abutting abutting neighbors regarding uh, privacy fencing at the um, rear of the property to mitigate against noise and spillover lighting from cars that are going to be parking in the backyard? We haven't talked. Um, we've shared the plans with them, and there have been some very basic email uh, correspondence, but we have not discussed with that with them. And we would be open to um, fencing the rear of that property. And I'm I'm talking a, a solid 2.1 meter sandwich board fence. Understood, Mr. Chairman. Because you're going to have you're going to have four parking spaces in the rear, correct? Yes. Yeah, and that's that's a fair amount of fair amount of sound that can be generated, and certainly a lot of spillover lighting, which I don't think any of the neighbors would appreciate. So I'd I'd suggest that uh, that uh, you and the applicant. Uh, Sit down and have a serious discussion with the budding, budding neighbors about uh, about providing a, a fence during the construction period. We, we, we certainly can do that, and we will do that. Okay, all right, Miss McLean, you had a question. Just a point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a point of clarification. I just wondered uh, the note, the notice of public hearing, the consent notice mentions the um, easements and rights of ways. For the shared driveway, but there's no request for a grant for consent to a grant of easement right away. I just wondered if that was an oversight or how that was going to be created. Right, uh, McLean, I'm not sure what you're referring to. So in the notice, it says the owner requires the consent of the committee for conveyances and a joint use and maintenance agreement. Uh, typically, we might see. Um, also included their grants of rights of ways easements to cover off the shared driveway. But um, I just wanted to bring it to your attention in case it was had been missed. But if you're comfortable with the way it's uh, framed, that's fine. Um, we'll look at it. I think we were comfortable with the way it was was framed. Um, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. OK. And uh, Ms. Ms. Bacula, uh, the, the planning department is in uh, in support of this application? Yes, Mr. Chair. Oh, Mr. Hamilton, okay. All right. So you, you have a, you're okay with, with, uh, with Mr. Mr. Hume's response to Ms. McLean on grants of easements? Yes, I agree. Okay, all right. Any questions from the other members of the panel before we get to the public? Other public presentations? No? Okay. All right. I have on the speakers list um, oh, Maxime Leroux. Yes, hello, Mr. Chair. Um, my Leroux. name is Maxime Leroux, and uh, I live at 1381 Maxime Street. Right beside. Exactly, yes, to okay. the south. Right. So, yes, so good day, uh, members of the committee. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me today. As you might know, I've submitted a letter report. Um, I also have a presentation to go along, which, um, which I've sent if, uh, if the presenter is able to load that on the screen. Thank 
Thank you. Okay, so we can go down to the second page, please. So just a quick background there. Uh, we moved into the neighborhood this summer so we could uh, raise our children and hopefully live in a nice, quiet neighborhood. Kind of, this neighborhood is kind of our, our dream home. So obviously we're really excited about uh, the opportunity to, to live here. Um, if we could go to the next page, please. So I did a quick little uh, streetscape style uh, analysis of the 21 surrounding properties. So as you can see there, um, it's the, uh, the property under question is, uh, has a star there. And as you can see around, it's, it's pretty much mainly uh, it's single detached homes. Um, there's a few duplexes around, but mainly it is a single detached home neighborhood. And then of course there's the, uh, the three unit residences that uh, Mr. Hume showed earlier, which, um, which are present nearby. Um, if, if we could go to the next slide, please. And then, so these are our two properties, the two neighbors that are directly between, um, as you can see, they're pretty small, uh, pretty small bungalows that are there. Uh, we could go to the next slide. Thank you. And then here you can see, uh, I have some screenshots there of other properties. So mainly we see quite a bit of uh, single detached homes, um, kind of small homes on nice size properties. Uh, we see some, a couple of duplexes there on the right. And then the bottom right corner, we have those uh, two, uh, three unit homes there, which are a little bit bigger, of course, than the other homes in the neighborhood, but are still considerably smaller than anything that's being proposed at the time. Also, um, it's fair to note that this neighborhood here is primarily a, a owner occupied neighborhood and adding these this type of development, which is essentially an eight unit development would basically turn this uh, neighborhood into a uh, kind of a, um, rental neighborhood, which obviously we, we don't want, right? Um, so we could go to you the next. Under, you understand, Mr. LaRue, that uh, un under the R2N zone, long detached, long semis are an allowable use. Yes. And that yes. secondary dwelling units are allowed as of right in the zoning bylaw as well. Yes, I do understand that. Okay, yeah, so thank that, you. So the applicant can build eight units on this on this property as of right. Okay. Um, here, here we see um, sort of kind of what it will look like. Basically, putting two really overpowering structures uh, right kind of between our two homes. Um, and then, if we go to the next slide, please. We have a petition, so we went around and asked people what they thought. Um, there's strong opposition. I think we had something like 23 people across 15 households. Um, we also had uh, our counselor, Tim Tierney. We talked to him about it, and he was also in opposition. And, and so we have quite a few emails that were sent through. So we can go down to the, the next slide, uh, page nine, please, where I kind of go over my arguments. So as we've seen, um, this would be obviously a huge uh, infringement on the character of the neighborhood. Um, like I said, there's it's primarily bungalows and duplexes. Um, and now we're, we're talking about adding some four unit homes, which is completely out of character. We're also, we'd also be significantly increasing uh, the traffic and uh, the parking would also be an issue. The proposed homes have 20 bedrooms. So, I mean, it's safe to assume we could have, you know, 15 cars there and there's only four parking spaces proposed. So we could have, you know, 10, 12 cars in need of some parking, uh, which what, could what be. Are the what are the parking restrictions on your street right now? Um, well, the parking, it's, it's only one-sided parking on our street. Okay. 
Um, so they'd effectively, there, there might, there probably isn't enough space even on our street for the cars to park. So they'd have to go over to other streets. Um, standard, standard parking, three hours, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And you can exactly. Yes. Okay. Typical, typical standard parking in right. this area. Thank you. Um, if we go to page 10, please. So then the issues of sunlight, privacy, and views uh, arise here. As we can see, the properties in red. So um, the house at 1367 would basically lose pretty much all of its sunlight. Um, and then the houses in the rear, 1380 and 1382, um, they would basically be lose all their privacy. They both have pools. The 1382, there, there's no pool in that picture, but they do have a pool. Um, so they'd effectively be losing their privacies with all the windows of the two units in the back. And then, of course, just the, the overall openness of the area uh, would essentially cease um, at that point as their structures are basically taking up the entire lot. And we'd basically be looking at a building and a parking lot. Uh, if we could go to page 11, please. So again, the mass bulk and height is an issue, as we've kind of stated, it creates the, a towering effect. And then the garbage issue is also a, a pretty big issue. Um, there is a small area for garbage in the back, but it, it won't be enough for, for eight units. There's still going to be an excess amount of trash. And if you look at some, this is the development, the, uh, the small little three unit homes. And there is quite a lot of garbage. It's just excess garbage, which doesn't really look clean for a neighborhood. And so we'd like to avoid that. If we can go down to the next page, page 13, please. So I have a few additional arguments. These, I'm not sure that they can be viewed by the committee. So I'm just gonna go over them real quick. So the, the residents are in opposition. I mean, we have the noise and light issue. Uh, noise from the cars coming in and then noise from AC units that are going to be there, uh, which are going to impede our enjoyment of our rear yards, the affected resale value. If we go to page 14, um, the owners have also not showed a duty of care since they've owned the property as they've owned it for uh, since summer of 2020. They haven't taken out their trash and they haven't cut the grass at all to the point where the city of Ottawa had to come and cut the grass. So we are very scared to what's going to be happening here in the future um, if they become leaders in our community. Uh, finally, if we can move on to page um, 16, please. So in this final section, I'll seek to prove that the four uh, statutory tests aren't satisfied um, and that technically even if one test isn't satisfied, the application should be rejected. Uh, so we could go to page 17. Is the variance minor? We do not believe that it is minor. Um, although the change in lot width and rear yard setbacks are not too large, it is the impacts that these changes cause that are major. Basically the difference between, you know, three and eight units. Um, if we go to page 18, uh, basically the difference between a, a fully blown mini apartment complex and just uh, typical residences. So as shown previously, the eight units would have a major impact related to increased traffic, parking issue, uh, the diminished character of the neighborhood, as well as loss of sunlight, privacy, and views, leading to a significantly reduced enjoyment of our property and our quality of life. Based on this, this variance is not believed to be minor. Um, if we could go to page 19, please. Is the variance desirable for the appropriate development or use of the property? Although the, the variance can be seen as desirable for the applicant who seeks to make money from this endeavor, it is not desirable from the perspective of the public, which is us, the neighbors, and because we are the ones who are going to be negatively impacted by this intrusion in our neighborhood and our overall livelihoods um, will be negatively impacted. So once again, we do believe that this test should fail. Finally, if we go to page 20, the general intent of the bylaw, we do not believe that this is maintained as this bylaw is there in place um, to protect the residents and to essentially prescribe front, rear, and side yard setbacks, building size, height, and use. 
Um, so in our case, the applicant seeks to make an exception to these rules um, that we, the residents agreed to purchase our homes under. In our case, we just purchased. Um, and so asking for an exception to enable the development would in fact reduce our quality of life. Um, and so we do not believe that the purpose of the bylaw is maintained. So in conclusion, if we go to page 21, to me, we've proven that the variances aren't minor. Um, they're not desirable to the public and the intent of the bylaw is not maintained. The residents um, are gonna be significantly negatively impacted. And as stated previously, our quality of life uh, will be decreased. And so this is a um, resident owned neighborhood and, and we do not believe that it should be a, should become a rental neighborhood, which it will if this is accepted, we're essentially gonna get immediately turned into a rental neighborhood. And therefore we respectfully ask um, that the application for minor variances be rejected. Um, on page 22, I just came up with some uh, alternatives. Um, and then yeah, page 23, just thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate and we appreciate of course the time you've taken today to uh, listen to our application and our defense. You're very welcome. Mr. Uh, Hamilton, are you there? Yes. This is an R2N zone. So <clears throat> as of right, what can you build on these kinds of lots? It is a range of houses from single detached to semis, long semis, and I believe towns, if I'm not mistaken, but the proposed use is permitted. And duplexes as well, correct? Correct. And the new official plan speaking to neighborhoods like this, what kind of direction does it give? Ground oriented, low rise uses similar to what is proposed. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Um, we also have uh, Mr. Blanchard and Ms. Lefebvre who are uh, who wanted to speak. Can't hear you, sir. Your, your audio's your audio's breaking up. <clears throat> nope. You sound like one of the chipmunks. Sir, your audio's not good at all. Uh, Mr. Blanchard, could you try calling in? Yeah, you probably have to use the phone. Chair, maybe we could move to the, the other delegation while Mr. Blanchard tries to call in. I don't. Is there not one more? No. Lefebvre? Or is that with Mr. Blanchard? Yeah. They're together. Oh, okay. Still can't hear you. No. Is there a way we can establish contact with Mr. Blanchard? Blanchard? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I'll reach out to him. Okay. 
Chair, if you want to stand this down um, and come back to it when Mr. Blanchard is on, I'm I'm happy to uh, to do that. That was that was going to be my next suggestion. Okay. Let's so, give uh, give staff a, a minute to see if they can establish contact. If not, we will stand it down. Okay. So I take it we still can't get through? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's correct. I don't have a phone number, so I just emailed him. All right, we'll stand this down and come back to it. Okay, Thank you for your patience, Mr. Hume. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm just gonna have to relocate myself out of this office I'm being moved. So uh, I, so if you could go to the next item and complete the item. Well, we'll do it. We've got, uh, we've got uh, three left. So we can go okay. through those three and then we'll, uh, we'll deal with the application last. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Bye -bye. All right, moving along, we'll deal with uh, item, item 18 on the agenda. And this is 275 Carling Avenue. And this is minor variances to permit an increased canopy projection and to permit a portion of the rooftop mechanical penthouse to be used for indoor amenity area associated with the permitted rooftop patio as permitted Good as permitted Mr. projection. It is proposed to construct a 16 story retirement home with four levels of underground parking and two ground floor commercial units. <clears throat> so the uh, PED report, there is an amendment to variance B. And it now reads to permit 217 square meters enclosed rooftop amenity area being a portion of the rooftop mechanical penthouse and associated with the permitted rooftop patio to project 4.76 meters above the maximum permitted building height of 52 meters, whereas the bylaw permits only an outdoor amenity area and a mechanical penthouse as permitted projections above the height limit. So that's the amendment and variance. It's A stays the same. So the uh, agent for this uh, for this application is Mr. Bouduk. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Okay. Before we begin, the oath or solemn declaration, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time. I do swear this to be true, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. And before we, before we begin, I asked Ms. Wakula um, the last time we, uh, we dealt with this to find out for us what the city uses uh, the guidelines, I guess, in the, in the creation of, mechanical penthouses on the on the roofs of apartment buildings like this. Yes, Mr. Chair, I inquired the engineering team and I've been told that city relies on cons consultants estimates on mechanical caps calculations. And I can speculate saying that equipment specifications may change over time and vary from uh, planning stage to implementation stage, but it's up to the applicant actually to provide why, by information why the mechanical penthouse was designed so big. Thank you. Yeah, well, the applicant can explain that. Thank you, Ms. Mikula. So there's no real, there's no real formula. No, you're right, Mr. Chair. That's, that's concerning. <clears throat> All right. Mr. Bilduk, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have a presentation. If uh, the coordinator could please pull up those slides. There 
we are. And so, yes, the application before you is a minor variance application to uh, make changes to the proposed building currently under construction. Uh, the first change is to add a canopy over the main entrance that extends to the sidewalk beyond the property line along Cambridge. Uh, the second is to permit a portion of the rooftop mechanical penthouse to be converted to amenity space uh, for the residents of the uh, retirement home under construction. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The subject property is located in the Glebe Annex community of the city of Ottawa uh, on the west side of the block abutting Carling Avenue, Cambridge, Bronson, and Clamau. Uh, the property was formerly a surface parking lot for the abutting office building, also under the ownership of the developer, uh, but is now under construction for a new 16-story retirement home. Uh, the parking will now be provided underground for both the new building and the existing office building per the approved site plan control application. Uh, I'll provide more history on the project in a minute, but uh, next slide, please. Uh, this image shows the property from Carling Avenue, uh, looking north towards Cambridge Street South, the subject property, the existing office building, and finally on the far right of the image, uh, the intersection of Carling and Bronson. Next slide, please. And this is an alternate perspective uh, showing the subject property from the intersection of Clamau and Cambridge, looking southeast across the property. Uh, the main entrance to the proposed building is located across, uh, along this frontage on Cambridge. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to touch briefly on the application history, uh, the original zoning bylaw amendment application for the construction of the retirement home was submitted to the city uh, in July 2012. Uh, it went through several stages uh, before in February 2017, the zoning bylaw amendment was approved uh, through bylaw 2017-41. Uh, the decision was then appealed to the uh, Ontario Municipal Board, which became the local planning appeal tribunal, uh, and an agreement was reached with the community association um, to amend bylaw 2017-41 to permit the construction of a 16-story uh, retirement home. Uh, following that, uh, the consent applications uh, at the time were approved to sever the property from the existing office building based on the previous developer uh, who was part of a joint venture with Katasa. Um, and there was also uh, a consent application in order to sever a portion of the property along Carling Avenue uh, in support of the right-of-way dedication. In August 2018, uh, a site plan control application was submitted, uh, and finally the site plan agreement was registered in November 2021. And here we are in February 2022, uh, looking at a minor variance application as we wrap up the building permit process. So to uh, speak briefly to that, essentially uh, at the tail end of the building permit process, it was identified that there were some opportunities to shift some of the equipment located within the mechanical penthouse as approved in the site plan control application, specifically the boilers. Um, they were moved from the uh, uh, subject portion of the mechanical penthouse underground, uh, thus freeing up some additional space within the uh, mechanical penthouse. And we engaged in discussions to see if there was anything we could uh, do to make use of this space. And we decided to pursue a minor variance application, as you noted, uh, as we have done on previous applications, um, to convert a portion of that mechanical penthouse to uh, amenity space for the residents of the retirement home. Uh, so next application, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, so there's actually two uh, variances as part of this application. Uh, the first is related to the main entrance along Cambridge uh, to permit a canopy to extend uh, to zero meters uh, or essentially past the lot line uh, from the corner side lot line, whereas it must be no closer than 0 0.6 meters. Um, this is essentially to provide shelter from the main entrance uh, up to the on-street lay-by uh, along Cambridge. Um, the second variance that's being sought is to permit a portion of the rooftop mechanical penthouse uh, to be used for indoor amenity space, uh, accessory to the uh, permitted rooftop patio space that is outside. Uh, I'll now walk you through the four tests. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the subject property is designated uh, Arterial Main Street under the uh, existing or old official plan. Uh, which permits a full range of uses as new sites develop towards compact, pedestrian-oriented, uh, mixed-use nature. A retirement home with a commercial component on the ground floor would fit this description uh, and, of course, has gone through zoning approvals and site plan control and conforms to the official plan. Uh, with respect to the new official plan, major corridor serves a, a very similar function. Uh, and the proposed variances support the development of a, a new retirement home in an area strategically located um, 
near existing and planned transit services. Um, and essentially the variance has come down to improving the quality of life for residences, uh, sorry, for residents, uh, including uh, improving accessibility to the building. Uh, so with that, so we do believe that it maintains the general intent and purpose of the official plan. Next slide, please. Uh, with respect to the proposed entrance canopy, uh, the design extends beyond the property line along Cambridge uh, to the edge of the sidewalk so as to protect residents and visitors from inclement weather <clears throat> arriving via the curbside layby. Uh, the canopy is designed without posts or other uh, support structures at the ground level to minimize any potential impacts associated with snow removal uh, or other regular maintenance and use of the public realm along that sidewalk. Uh, for the proposed rooftop amenity space, oh sorry, next slide please. Uh, for the proposed rooftop amenity space, uh, Section 64 of the Zoning Bylaw permits projections above the height limit for certain building elements, including mechanical penthouses, rooftop gardens and terraces, and access structures to these features. Uh, I've identified on the image, uh, on this image of the rooftop plan, um, the areas that are considered core elements, core mechanical elements, including the elevators and the staircases, um, as well as yellow for the access lobby uh, to shelter the elevator uh, and other elements from the weather. Um, and then of course the green areas are what's actually subject to this application um, being the conversion of those spaces to permit additional amenity space within the mechanical penthouse. Um, and that's where, and, and the amenity space that you're identifying in green is where the boilers used to be or were going to be? Predominantly, yes. There is one small exception. You'll note a little green box uh, closer to, the, I suppose, the southwest of the image. Uh, that's an additional uh, washroom facility. Um, so that is one point that I wanted to bring up is that um, technically washrooms don't meet this definition uh, for permitted projections. So any washrooms in addition to the storage area that we're proposing or the core amenity area, which is, includes a seating, uh, seating arrangement and, and kitchen, um, sort of a party room arrangement, um, those are all considered um, gross floor area and therefore don't meet section 64 as is. So we have to structure the variance to seek that those would be permitted as a projection. Um, we have done this on, well, I'll come back to my notes in a minute, but we have sought, sought this method on previous applications. Um, and I actually had an inverse situation on a non-residential file in the past where um, we met with staff and discussed this permitted projection approach. Uh, in that case, it was for amenity space related to an office building in the Canada West Business Park. And we were told at that time that um, amenity spaces are not necessarily uh, required or, or, or necessary for uh, an office building. And therefore it would be considered not a projection, not something that is necessarily desirable. And we would have to seek an amendment to the building height. Whereas for residential buildings, uh, similar to another project that we had um, where there is amenity space within the building and you're seeking to supplement that amenity space, then an appropriate mechanism is to apply for a minor variance to permit those spaces as a projection. It's also my understanding that you would try to uh, impose restrictions on there, right? Limit it to the plans, identify the square area, uh, as well as the maximum building height permitted to that uh, uh, portion of the mechanical penthouse. And that's what we've done through the amending of the application. So to come back to my notes in my presentation, um, Previously, the main portion of the proposed amenity area was the boiler room, as I mentioned, containing seven boilers. Uh, but through the building permit process, these were shifted underground and this space was opened up and we sought to make a, a best use of that space, recognizing that uh, we had to mitigate for any potential impacts on adjacent properties. Next slide, please. So this is sort of a, an overview of what we just went over that. The amenity spaces proposed include, like I said, washroom facilities, storage, as well as just general amenity space. Um, I would note again that this application would be required for any of these spaces on an individual basis. In this case, we have all three. So in order to permit washrooms on a rooftop uh, adjacent to a permitted outdoor rooftop patio, um, this is the correct process that would be required if it hadn't already been handled through the previous zoning bylaw amendment. Um, but as I mentioned in the application history that was uh, conducted many years ago, the original application was in 2012. Uh, and in this case, we are um, bringing this forth at this time post site plan approval as part of the building permit uh, uh, process. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. 
Uh, this slide shows the extent of the amenity space with respect to the other floors of the building. The proposed amenity area is about 27.6% of the floor plate of the uppermost story, the 16th floor. Uh, it's about 24% of the other tower floors. And it's about 16% of the floor plate of the three-story podium. Uh, further, I'd like to draw attention uh, that this uh, image would have uh, Cambridge on the upper part, the north side. So we're looking at a, a, an inverted image, essentially. Um, basically, the, the amenity area is strategically located to the inside of the building at, or the, the interior portion of the floor plate uh, so that it's adjacent to the office building. Um, and that way it's away from the residential areas to the north and the west. So it's not necessarily pushing the amenity space closer to the edge of the building. It's concentrating it to the inside and making an adaptive reuse of that space uh, that we feel supports the residents and their visitors. Um, it adds more amenity to, to the building and, and we don't believe that it's located in an area that would cause impacts on other adjacent properties. Next slide, please. So we believe that the canopy is appropriate uh, as it will shelter access to the site and assist with the maintenance of the main entrance, keeping it free of snow and other potential issues for barrier free and safe access to the retirement home. Uh, with respect to the indoor rooftop amenity space I just described, uh, it will support residents by providing additional communal amenity space in a repurposed portion of the building, as well as providing important washroom facilities and an area for storage uh, of maintenance equipment, uh, such as window washing equipment. Uh, the indoor amenity space also supports the function and good use of the permitted outdoor patio space. Um, this image is just a concept. It's, it's not exactly what's going there, but it does illustrate the type of um, side patio that would be uh, uh, proposed, that is proposed or essentially permitted. Um, and we believe that the variances are appropriate and desirable for the use of the lands um, as they generally support the, the uh, function and operations of the retirement home. And next slide, please. And once again, to touch briefly on the canopy, uh, we recognize that it's sensitively designed to minimize any risk of impacts on pedestrians and vehicles, uh, including maintenance equipment, uh, such as sidewalk plows. Uh, and it's not anticipated to generate any ad undue adverse impacts on the public realm or adjacent properties. The proposed indoor rooftop patio uh, occupies a space previously reserved for mechanical equipment at the center of the building. Uh, the variance does not seek to change the exterior of the structure and therefore proposes no additional shadowing or other building impacts on adjacent lots. Further, as I mentioned, the area is located to the east of the mechanical core, which would remain unchanged and set away from the residential area, mitigating for any potential impacts from lighting or noise from open windows or any other potential impacts associated with this space. It simply provides additional amenity space for a retirement home with no material impacts on the building and no undue adverse impacts on adjacent lands. And once again, I reiterate that um, we would be here for this application if the amenity area was simply washrooms. Um, so section 64, um, it, it's, it's an interesting discussion with respect to 64, if, if washrooms perhaps should be permitted as of right, but um, right now we would be required to go through this process. Um, and so next slide, please. Just out of curiosity, if you just yes. want to back it up one. Sorry. Just back, if you can back, yeah. Um, that's what side of I'm looking at South Elevation, Crowley Avenue. Is that Correct. a chiller? Is that a chiller on the uh, on the roof on the on the top right? Uh, I would defer to uh, the project architect who is here, Colleen McCarricker from Roderick Leahy, um, with respect to any of the structural and mechanical details. Because if that is a chiller, I know exactly how loud those things can be, and I think you'd better give serious consideration to putting sound attenuation around that unit. Um, I think that's duly noted, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I would note that it is located on, uh, to, to provide some context for the image, that would be located on top of the proposed amenity space. Yeah. Uh, you'll note that right to the next of that is the elevator overrun, um, which at that height would be required regardless of these variances, yeah. um, because the elevator does provide access to the rooftop patio, which is located on the, uh, the left side or the west side of that image. Yeah. Um, noise, the noise bylaw is pretty clear on the uh... On the DBs at point of reception, and uh, so if the architects are looking, are putting, are putting a big, big chiller up there, it needs to be, it needs to be muffled for sure. I'll just look up and, right now what the mechanical equipment is, and I do believe we have a acoustic report to go along with the building. All right. Okay. All right. Please continue, Mr. Bulldog. Uh Next slide, please. 
Um, we've seen this slide. I'm just returning to it because I think it does illustrate the point that um, we, after speaking with the community association, and, and I don't know if you want me to touch on the adjournment and the work that we've done over the last few weeks, but there were a lot of concern raised that essentially this is permitting a 17th floor. Um, we don't necessarily agree with that interpretation. The structure itself would be developed as is, as per the site plan approval. We're simply uh, reallocating a portion of that interior space to amenities for the residents. It's not an additional dwelling unit or a penthouse unit. It's communal amenity space for the residents of the retirement home. Uh, and given its sensitive location to the interior uh, of the block um, and the fact that it represents you know, a quarter of the, of the main floor plate, um, I, I think it shows that the application is, is minor in nature with respect to impacts uh, and an overall size with respect to the floor plate. Um, so in conclusion, I do believe that the application meets the four tests. Um, the canopy is designed not to negatively impact the public realm. The proposed amenity space is, is small uh, and located so as to mitigate for any potential impacts. And overall, the proposal is not anticipated to generate any undue in adverse impacts on adjacent properties. Um, and therefore, we uh, support the application. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. The, uh, the lobby, uh, the lobby as identified in your, uh, in your schematic of the roof. <clears throat> that was public access to begin with to the elevator banks. That's uh, yeah. Essentially, when you leave the elevator, you want to have. So um, that was that was always <clears throat> always intended as public access to the roof. Correct. That is that and, 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 and in patio. Correct. And we are interpreting that as an access structure, which is permitted under Section 64. So yeah. the green areas are highlighted are the only ones that would meet the definition of gross floor area and require mm -hmm. this variance. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mr. Wildman had a question, I believe, for, for comment. Um, yeah, just a quick question. The, the, the uh, canopy, the, the, the height from grade, can you remind me what that is? The, uh, the height of the canopy from, from grade? grade? Yeah, finished grade. Uh, I don't have that information readily available. Uh, Colleen, would you happen to have that? Grab that out in just a second. Um, it is at a bit of a slight incline up. Um, so would you like the lowest point where it sort of meets at the door? Is uh, three meters and then that will continue sort of uh, up at the sidewalk to continue up to about 3.7 meters. Okay, thank you. Um, the planner, uh, if I could speak with the city planner for one minute. Yes, Mr. Wilma. I'm uh, just wondering, uh, was this circulated to operational staff, like right away management or uh, anyone in, in the operational side, that this particular uh, request? They are providing usually the comments to the Committee of Adjustment Applications, and I haven't received any concerns regarding that. Okay, so just, just to be clear, it did go to the operational staff? Uh, they're part of the circulation of okay. the committee applications, yes. So it likely right-of-way management would have seen this then? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, and, and I'm comfortable now, Mr. Chair. Okay. Ms. McLean, you had questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to Mr. Bolduc, just um, uh, the mechanical room um, is 413 square meters. Did I read that right off the... Uh, one of your sheets. I believe that to be correct. Uh, that would be the full structure, uh, including the lobby core elements, as well as the requested amenity area. And then 217 square meters of that 413 will be um, amenity area. That's correct. Okay. Um, and so just a comment, when, when a bylaw, um, uh, it's in this case, it's not a prohibition, but the bylaw permits only an outdoor amenity area. I think there's a higher threshold to be met here um, in asking the committee to um, allow something that the bylaw does not allow. And so um, when I look at the dimensions here, you're asking for um, over half, what do you say, of the mechanical room to be something that the bylaw doesn't allow? It would show that it's a, it's just over half, yes. 
Okay. Is there any reason why um, the mechanical room cannot be reduced in its size? It's not built yet, I take it. No, we do have site plan approval uh, for that size. Uh, I suppose, yes, the, it could be reduced uh, should the committee not uh, uh, agree with this application. Um, but my understanding conversely is that as it's approved through the site plan approvals process, uh, it could be built at this size, whether it remains empty or used. Um, so this is where we're coming down to the impacts are effectively the same. Um, whether there's the boiler room in there or the amenity space, um, it's the same box essentially, but it, it could be reduced uh, theoretically, yes. So maybe then I'll just ask the planner, um, city planning, um, why this the bylaw does not permit an enclosed amenity area to project. It, it, it simply states it can only be an outdoor amenity area. Um, I'm afraid I don't have a, an answer for that because uh, I don't know exactly the intent behind that, but there were extensive communication with uh, senior planning staff regarding uh, this amenity areas and they expressed non con no concerns. And upon the review, I researched other applications that were approved on the similar merits for uh, amenity areas. The difference was that they were only one story mechanical penthouses, and this one is for the two stories. Okay, thank you. Sorry that I didn't have the right away answer. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Mr. McLean? No, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you're done too, Mr. Wellman. Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, all right, thank you, Mr. Balduk. We have, uh, I believe, one member of the public who'd like to speak to this. Is he there? Mr. Mr. Hagajanian, I believe. Uh, hold on. Yeah, hi. Uh I, uh, I did not uh, ask to speak, but I oh. did uh, want to join the uh, Zoom meeting to see okay. that. Oh, all right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any other questions or comments from the members of the panel? I'd like to reserve on this application for the discussions after we're done. Um, so that, that being said, I think we can uh, we'll reserve and uh, you'll receive the um, our decision in, uh, in 10 days. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. This application is... Uh, 88 Orvergale Road. It's a minor variance to permit reduced front yard setbacks and reduced lot widths. Proposed to construct a two story semi detached dwelling. The existing dwelling is to be demolished. Uh, since we, since we um, adjourned this in January, there have been changes to the, <clears throat> to the variance requests. Um, the front yard setback reductions have been uh, removed. So we're left with two variances, to, one to permit a reduced lot width of 8.06 for the southerly portion of the lot, and the other one to permit a reduced lot width of 8.08 .08 meters for the northerly portion of the lot, both 80, 88, 88 and 86 are the Gale Road. So, Mr. Jelkazi, I believe, is the uh, is the agent on this application. Is he there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Mr. Jelkazi, let's uh, administer the oath or declaration. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing? 
and clearly visible and legible during the entirety of that time. I swear. All right, Mr. Jalakatsi, please uh, proceed. I have a presentation, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, as part of this application, we have uh, had extensive uh, discussions now with both the committee planning staff and as well um, with uh, some of the neighbors and also with the community association. Mm -hmm. The community association was kind enough to put on a uh, public open house meeting uh, early in January. And uh, you can see the uh, response to that meeting in our letter to the committee and I'll cover some of those issues uh, further on. Next slide please. This actually was a little bit of a surprise to me in the sense that um, a comment was made about how the garages on the houses at 80, 82 and 88 ended up and also in part on uh, 2202, ended up in part uh, on Ogilvy Road. Um, so I did a little digging into the history, and it's actually quite interesting that the homes at 80, 82, and uh, 88 um, were actually homes that were front yard facing Pooler Avenue and backyard lane facing uh, the, our, our subject street. Um, you'll see that the houses that existed in 1928 uh, that were there in 1928, uh, the ones that have an X in them have been demolished since then. The others, I'm not that certain about 79 when it came in, uh, in terms of its uh, relationship and whether or not it's very hard in the photograph to tell whether there is a house there or not at, at this time. Next slide, please. So what we had here was a very unusual circumstance where we had front yards being redeveloped um, and houses being reorientated uh, in, this, in the sense that we ended up with garages facing um, the street now on the street line. And this actually became quite a discussion with planning staff um, in terms of the streetscape analysis, and I'll cover that in a moment. But as you can see, uh, the yellow homes, the yellow circles, are all new homes uh, that have been redeveloped. And so we actually have a total of 15 new dwellings that have been added uh, since that original uh, subdivision in 1928 uh, existed. Um, the, uh, all of the homes now on Pooler Avenue have normal backyards, uh, backyard setbacks, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, the homes uh, that we have most of the discussions about, 80, 82, 88, and 92, all of them um, uh, have exhibit uh, this uh, sort of somewhat abnormal uh, circumstance with a detached garage facing the street. So as part of the streetscape analysis, when I did that, um, given the way the descriptions on A, B, and C are for um, attached garages. Um, my opinion differed from that of the cities in the sense that um, I felt that the closest analogy for a detached garage in the front yard would be an attached garage or a carport in the front yard or in the front of the property. Uh, city staff and I have worked on that side of things and they've determined that those garages constitute a um, uh, parking space uh, that is, I guess, in a garage in this case, but it is a parking space that is a non-conformed but uh, legal use uh, in that front yard. So that's where we ended up with actually exactly the same streetscape analysis that we previously had uh, in the sense that the predominant pattern uh, is a driveway 
um, but not a uh, attached garage or a carport. Next slide, please. A little bit about the eclectic nature of the homes on this street. Uh, they vary. There's lots of new ones. There's some old ones. Uh, particularly on the east side of the street, there are basically newer homes uh, compared to 1928 uh, because the 1928 homes have been, uh, been removed. If we look on the next slide, please. If we look on the west side of the street, you'll see there that we have more of the older cottages uh, that existed. Um, the one obviously that my client has is in rather poor shape. Uh, two others don't appear to be in very good shape. Uh, however, um, you know, they are still being lived in and are still comfortable residences and could be quite re renovated from that perspective. We also have a bit of a modern box um, uh, design uh, on the street as well that's attached to one of the existing uh, uh, older cottages. Uh, from a heritage perspective, that's actually a preferred option in the sense that uh, it's very distinct uh, in nature from the existing um, older cottage. Uh, the other house is obviously newer. Next slide, please. So as originally submitted, the plan called for semi-detached on this property with minor variances for lot width and lot, uh, front, lot depth, uh, front yard depth. Um, I did that again uh, out of abundance of caution in terms of ensuring that uh, uh, we didn't miss any minor variances. It turns out that because we have a six meter setback, uh, that fully complies with the zoning bylaw in terms of front yard setback. There's no requirement for a front yard setback minor variance. Um, we actually have a larger and from the very initial get go had uh, provided plans with a 1.5 meter side yard, uh, whereas a 1.2 meter side yard is only what's required. Um, based on all of the conversations with the community and everybody else and part of the streetscape analysis, what we have uh, decided to do is to actually pinch the building uh, in the front uh, a bit, uh, a total of uh, 0.9 meters on either side, so that's three feet, um, from the front of the building to uh, um, six meters back, 6.6 .6 meters back on the building. This makes it so that it presents itself as a smaller front mass. Um, at the ground floor, of course, we have the uh, driveway that is going underneath the overhang of the second floor. Um, so that area at the ground floor is pinched down even further by another 1.8 meters on either side. The benefit that this brings, the 1.5 meters uh, and pinching down the building, uh, means that by complying with the 1.8 meter overhang requirement under the bylaw and streetscape analysis for a front uh, driveway, um, we end up getting a substantial side green space on either side of the property of 1.55 meters. So this uh, adds uh, additional buffer for both snow removal and for um, plantings in the summertime uh, between the properties. So a, a real um, uh, a benefit in that regard to uh, the, the buildings. Next slide, please. Here you can see this. Uh, in three dimensions. We're also showing the potential roof slopes that uh, could be generated depending on whether the client goes with a flat roof approach or with a slope roof approach. Uh, you can see here as well that the uh, building overall front uh, width has been reduced by 1.8 meters in total. Uh, the bylaw requirements for a single family home and for the semi-detached in terms of setbacks are uh, the same. Um, and in this case, uh, because we've increased the side yard to 1.5 meters over the required 1.2 meters, uh, there's an additional 
uh, side yard that uh, uh, has been created that was would not be there if somebody, for example, built a very large single family home. Next slide, please. A little bit about the sun shadows. Uh, we did mass up as part of the uh, public meeting, the entire uh, neighborhood uh, in terms of the homes to the best of my ability off of Google Earth. We do that. Uh, it's not unusual. We're not dead on here, but uh, it's reasonably good. Uh, we do actually have an application called CAD Mapper that provides us with the footprint of all of the buildings uh, from, uh, for, for the city of Ottawa. You can see here the shadow noon summer solstice uh, from the existing building up in the upper uh, left hand corner. And then if you go in the lower left hand corner, you see summer solstice. Um, so uh, at 3 p.m., uh, the shadow lines of the buildings. And if you look uh, in the upper right hand corner, you'll see noon winter solstice. Uh, and to that extent, at noon winter solstice, um, there is a shadow line that uh, does go to the house uh, to the north, but uh, a significant component of the back part of the house is already in the sun. And then even in the winter time for the 3 p.m. winter solstice uh, time, uh, the house uh, is fully uh, in, um, in, in the sun. Next slide, please. This uh, delineates the elevation potential from the design that we've done. Um, just a, a note with regards to the maximum unprotected opening. Uh, for an area of this side under OBC, uh, the uh, permitted unprotected opening is 8%. Uh, the client is limiting that to 7% uh, so as to reduce uh, the potential for any large windows facing north or south. Um, in terms of the uh, elevations for flat roof, pitched roof, um, uh, a steeper slope roof would provide even a lower side wall um, or some combination of those as well um, is what uh, um, is being uh, uh, reviewed. But all of these fit within the height limit requirements and the zoning bylaw requirements of the City of Ottawa. Next slide, please. So from the four test perspective, um, adverse impact of granting the variance. There is no adverse impact as a detached building can be constructed without any variances to the exact same footprint as massing and actually to a broader footprint in massing than we've actually uh, chosen to uh, use. Uh, so the client has agreed to reduce the footprint and overall square footage of the semi-detached uh, below what they would normally be permitted um, under the zoning bylaw. There are some benefits to the neighboring province in that regard. So the reduction in unprotected openings on the north and south side being reduced from 8% to 7%, reduced width of the building in the front, increased landscaping, landscaping buffer to the driveway. Uh, in terms of the intent of the zoning bylaw, it permits uh, semi-detached and two-story uh, buildings. The new official plan supports infill intensification in established neighborhoods um, to reduce the demand for greenfield development. And under the provincial policy statement under PTS, settlement areas intended for primary focus of growth. Um, these subject lands are within the urban boundary of the city of Ottawa and constitute a settlement area. Um, the last comment uh, I have, I really have to thank uh, both the committee uh, I know it hasn't been uh, a great uh, discussion with, uh, with the community. I would have preferred, and had I realized the concerns that have arisen, I would have approached this differently. Um, that's for sure. I did not really think this was as disconcerting as it has, uh, has become or is. Um, and that, for that reason, uh, I've worked with the client as much as I could uh, to try to modify the building to address the concerns around snow, trees. We've communicated with the neighbor on, on uh, Pool um, Street behind, uh, so we have an agreement with them to protect their very big maple that is quite far back off the property to the extent that uh, um, 
Astrid, the, uh, the um, arborist, missed it, uh, didn't think it had an effect, but we, we agree that it, our development, if we were to not stay clear of the backyard, so we have a 10 meter backyard, 10.8 meter backyard, and so we will not be encroaching into the critical root zone of that tree. Uh, however, uh, we need to create a no-go zone uh, for the contractors uh, so that they, when they're doing the demolition, uh, don't affect that area. In addition, there are concerns around a lot of grading, drainage, uh, access to the street. Uh, I think um, the owner of the property has made it clear that uh, he will stay in constant communication with the neighbors. Um, uh, he does understand, uh, I think he heard it very loud and clear at the public meeting, that uh, this street is really tight. Um, when the snow removal or snow plowing is done there, it even becomes much tighter. Uh, so it goes from seven meters to the uh, pavement width and sometimes significantly less than the pavement width, which is, you know, 3.5 meters or, or 3.6 meters. So there, there needs to be an abundance of care and caution taken to make sure that access is always maintained um, on that street. Uh, so they are, uh, the, the owner is very aware of that and is very committed uh, to working with the neighbors to try to minimize the disruption that is going to occur with this construction, but ensure that access will always be maintained. Thank you, Mr. Jilkatsi. Any questions or comments from the panel? Ms. McLean. Uh, just given the nature of the request for uh, reduced lot width, would you have any information on the um, sizes of lots in the, in the area? Are there any uh, similar size lots? Yes, if you go uh, just to the block to the north, uh, and the street that's running east-west, uh, you'll note that the sizes of the lots for the semis are similar. Uh, the width is uh, less uh, than um, what's required under the bylaw, but I must remind you that the lot area is significantly more than what's required under the bylaw. Um, so the variance is minor in this location and uh, really uh, this uh, should be seen on its own merits in this location as a property uh, that meets the four tests, uh, and particularly in being minor uh, and also providing uh, additional side yards and additional um, green space and additional um, uh, landscape space adjacent to the laneways to minimize um, any uh, impact on the neighboring properties. And I assume, Mr. Jolkatsi, that uh, when uh, when the drainage and grading plan is approved by the city after this process is over and done with it, that drainage and grading plan is going to be circulated to the neighbors? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think you can see from our letter to the committee that we're very transparent about all of our communications and that we will continue to be transparent. As soon as that uh, letter was finalized on Saturday, I circulated it to the community association immediately. Um, I hope that uh, she would have uh, also circulated to, uh, to those other people who were part of the process. Okay, All right. Thanks for your presentation. Um, for the Woodruff North Community Association, Ms. Glass or Mr. Grosner, who wishes to speak? Hi, um, I'm Susan Glass and I'm going to speak first and Mr. Grosner is gonna speak at the end and there's two others in the middle in between. Your, uh, your, uh, your address for the record, please, ma'am. I'm at 2163 Saunders. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. <laughs> we submitted um, our reasons for asking you to deny this lot. With I would like to highlight three issues. One of the issues is that, as Mr. Jalkotzi showed us in his illustrations, I don't know if it's possible to bring any of them back to the screen, 
but the proposed building is going to be standing 12 or 13 meters ahead of the abutting neighbors, which means that this building is going to be built effectively on a front lawn. And that's something I have not seen anywhere in the neighborhood. In fact, uh, we've had, of course, many large semis built in our neighborhood. And I see there's a screen coming up. Let's wait for a moment. Yes, that's a good one. So you can see the size of the house to the right, which is the house to the north. So that that neighbor who comes out on her front porch in the morning really is just going to look at a wall where she has had a visual corridor to look on down through the street. Anyone walking on the street and Orvigale is a pedestrian corridor. It's too short and too narrow to have any car traffic. So it's an excellent street for pedestrians to be walking down. But what we argue is that the placement of that uh, house as proposed is going to bisect the street. And I have spoken to a number of people developers, real estate people, architects who watch uh, the development of real property. And really, I, uh, they have never heard of another example. I have not heard of another example of a house built on a front lawn. And I know if I heard from my next door neighbor that he was going to build a house on a front lawn, I'd be uh, seriously opposed. So that is one big problem that unfortunately, th this, this house on this lot, because it can't get set back farther because of the uh, 10 meters or what it is in the back, has to sit six meters back from the front. And I understand that the city planners have granted this as of right but I must comment that when that granting was, uh, was um, announced back in December, there was no mention of the width of Orvigale Road, which is functionally four meters wide and has a right of way 7.2 or 7.3. But think about the standard six meter setback on a standard road that has a road allowance of 20 meters. You've got a ratio of six to 20, whereas here you've got a ratio of six to seven. So that a six meter setback on a seven meter right of way means that this house is very far forward from the center of the street and very close to the house across the lane. And I noticed in his notes, Mr. Jalkotzi said, well, there are places in the city where houses are quite close across the lane. There are narrow lanes. Sure, in Hindenburg, for example, we see very narrow streets like this with houses abutting each other lined up on either side and close together. That is the character of Hindenburg. This is not the character of Orvigale. So that is one point I wanted to make. Another, Mr. Jalkotsi showed you some photographs of the older cottages. There are four of them that are 100 years old or more. And Orvigale, named after Orville and Gale, by the way, was a footpath that evolved into a back lane, as Mr. Jalkotsi explained, and then became a road. But the, the uh, old hundred year old buildings are clustered on the Northwest part of the road, especially. This part of the road, the Southwest part of the road really had beautifully generous setbacks. They still do a lot of green space, but this one house, as I say, is going to build, be built in a front lawn and bisect that part of the street. There are only six houses on each side. It's a very short street. So this house will not melt away into 25 or 50 houses. 
on a streetscape. All of our big semis in our neighborhood on all the other streets that are wider, of course, than Orvigale have semis that are aligned with the older houses. This is an extraordinary situation. We are opposed. It will have a major impact on the visual corridor, the sunlight, the drainage, and more than anything, the social fabric of the street to have one house so much larger than the others on the front lawn bisecting the block. The last thing I'd like to address is the cottage aspect of the street. When we met with Mr. Jalkotzi on January 3rd, it was quite shocking to hear him say, after I spoke about the history, that is really a big part of our quality of life in the neighborhood, not only the street. But when I spoke of the history, Mr. Jalkotzi pronounced the history is gone. Even though there were four residents, well, maybe that would translate to eight residents of the old houses that have been there a hundred years or more. So for us, the history of the neighborhood, which was settled 200 years ago, and we still have some of these older cottages that are surviving because they are in a cluster. In my 12 years in the neighborhood, I have seen already a number of cottages demolished. And as they were standalone, it was easy for them to be demolished and something else replaced them. Somehow there's strength in numbers with these four houses on Orvigale and it makes it a very special street. Uh, it really concerns me that Mr. Jalkotzi doesn't appreciate that the history is really meaningful to us. It's not in our imagination. It takes a lot of effort and care to live in old houses and it's what we choose and it makes the, the neighborhood unique. Again, the official plan really emphasizes livability, the uniqueness of Ottawa, the uniqueness of its landmarks. Our community is entirely based on the river settlement and eventually our little village of Woodruff amalgamated with Ottawa. So those are the major points I wanted to make today and thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Ms. Glass. Mr. Grosner. Um, Mr. Chair, I believe Joe Shabib was to speak next. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, Joe was to speak next. Oh, Mr. Shabib. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I uh, wanted to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee for your time. Um, I live at 96 Orvigale, and I just wanted to uh, say that uh, being one of the residents that lives on the west side of Orvigale, we support uh, the letters and all the hard work that the WNCA has uh, submitted. And um, yeah, we're, we're just generally concerned about the uh, variances that are being requested and we'd ask that they uh, at this time not be approved. Uh, there's more than enough room on that property for the, as the, the developers said, there's a lot of room on that property and they can build a structure and maximize their profit with the, within existing uh, bylaws. Um, I just want to mention when I'm the, actually the most recent uh, I occupy the home that was most recently built on the west side of Orvergale. And when my property was built, the city, uh, as an exception, changed the property line to ensure that I would be set back adjacent to the homes next to me. So uh, if you look at, uh, again, the slide that the coordinator had up previously, mm -hmm. um, my property line pushes my house back to ensure that my house would not encroach and sort of jut out on uh, the west side of uh, Orvigale. I'm on the far, far left, if you will, of the uh, excellent diagram that, uh, that uh, the uh, developer provided. So again, I, I appreciate uh, your time and just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shabib. 
Ms. Johnston, I believe, is next. Can't hear you. Sorry. That's all right. And <laughs> your address is your address is 2198 Deshane? That is correct. Okay, please proceed. I live in a 115-year-old house on the corner of Deshane and Orvigale. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. I have a little presentation and it's going to give you um, a street level view of what you've just seen in architectural renderings. Next slide, please. So um, I wanna point out, this is our neighborhood from an aerial view. I think you've seen a couple of uh, this slide a couple of times, but you can see how tiny it is. And the property, it's got a real cottagey context. And the city's official plan, as I've heard over and over today, is to provide livability and, um, and character. And that uh, any new infill is to be kept in with the character. And it's all to promote healthy living and healthy communities. Well, that's all based on the streetscape. Communities based in front yards, not backyards. And in, on Orvigale and on Duchesne, we have that. The kids run wild all over the neighborhood and every kid in the neighborhood on both sides of, of Woodruff have learned to ride their bikes on, on Orvigale because it's so safe. Orvigale's a great little community. And if we destroyed the streetscape of Orvigale, I mean, it, it's a piece of history that's gone forever and it'll destroy the fabric of our community. Next slide, please. That's the property in question. Uh, next. So um, Mr. Jalkowski provided something from 1928. This is a 1933 aerial shot of, of our neighborhood. And as you can see, it's not really very changed. Uh, the four houses that we were talking about are right there at the inner, on the northeast, cor northeast and west corners and in the middle. And it's just a few other houses that have been added since, but it's all very recognizable. Next slide. That's the circle is the house. And that's this. So this is the open context of the street as it is right now. Um, if you click, you'll see the open space highlighted. Yes, and then uh, next is their, their blue lines that define, I think you have to click again, all the front spaces of all the houses right now. Those are the front, front uh, frontages of all the existing houses. Next. Uh, this is this isn't working quite right. They're supposed to be, there we go. So that line is where the uh, proposed frontage of the new house is going to be. And next, that's the new house in con the, under proposal. Next, that line um, is where the existing front yards fall. So you see there's quite a big difference between the front yards or the frontages of the houses of the existing uh, houses and the proposed one. Next. And the, the neighborhood would like, the neighborhood really welcomes new development. We would like to see a nice new house there, but we would like it further back in keeping with the structure and the fabric of the existing neighborhood. Next. And as you can see, that's, that lines up with the existing houses, next. And that's the line of the proposal. So you can see there's a huge corridor there of where um, the developer wants to build and where the neighborhood would like to see him build. Next.
this is what Orvid Gale Lane looks like in real life and not architectural drawings. This is looking um, from the north corner looking south. And as you can see, it's a, they, we've all talked about how it's four meters wide, one car fits. There's no point in talking about seven meters right of way because it's not usable by any car. Next. And that's what um, the green block represents what this edifice would look like. That's the space it would take up. You can see that it just completely blocks out any view down the Orvigale and it's looming quite close to the street. Next. Those red lines are the corners that help define where that, um, the new proposal will be. But as you can see, it's just right on the street and it's going to loom and block everything. This view is where the neighbors would like it to be move back and um, more in accordance with the houses on the street. Next. Again, the corners that define it. And the one out in front showed the difference between the two that were what we would like to see and what is being proposed. Next. Next. So this is 88 Orvigale um, from the south end of the street looking north. And the green block is what's proposed. So you can see exactly how close it is to the street and how little room that there's going to be for anything. Um, we've seen the development on Duchesne when they too put houses in accordance with the city zoning and the illegal parking that's resulted, everyone says, well, the neighbors can call, but that doesn't make, call and report it and they'll get a citation, but that doesn't make for a healthy, livable neighborhood if you're calling and reporting on your neighbors all the time. It should just be taken into account before the property's built. We think that the impact here of the city planning it's an unintended consequence of zoning. It was never intended for a little tiny laneway like ours. Next. And those define the corners. Next. And that's, if this were moved back, it would be more in accordance with the social fabric of our street. It would respect the houses that are already there. Next. And those are, that shows you the difference in where we would like to see it and where it currently is proposed. It's just going to be a monolithic building looming over this tiny, tiny little lane. Next. That's it. Anyway, thank you for uh, listening to me today. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Ms. Johnston. Mr. Grosner, I believe you're next. Yep. No picture. We can hear you. Okay, uh, I'm sorry about the fact that you're I can't. Your see. address for the record, please. Okay, yes. I live at 75 Pooler Avenue, a uh, house okay. I co designed and built in on an infill lot in uh, 1984. So I've been around for a while. As president of the Woodruff North Community Association for more than 10 years, I've been involved with a few of these uh, contentious uh, uh, housing developments. But this one really takes the cake, I must admit. Very difficult to deal with. The effect that the proposed semi-detached structure would have on the immediate community is so overwhelming that it's hard to understand how it could be approved for construction in a city that prides itself on beautiful community design. The fact is 
that the proposed structure takes up almost 100% of the allowed, uh, allowed out lot area and presents a massive block unlike anything around it. Had the proposed, uh, uh, I'm sorry, has the proposal been a building of a typical city street having a 20 meter wide road allowance, the structure would have been an additional six and a half meters from the center of the road than in the current plan. Assuming the buildings on both sides of the road had front setbacks of six meters, these buildings would be 32 meters apart, not 17 as in the current plan. And this uh, would mean that uh, there's almost double the spacing than, than, than the current situation. Where's the privacy there? Having had some experience in house planning, I sketched out several possible building footprints that would perhaps provide a better fit in the area. The ideal structure would be a detached three to 4,000 square foot house that would be set back about 12 meters from Orbegail and would present no need for variations. I'm sorry, for, for variances. This would obviously fit the streetscape much better, but would not be as lucrative a venture. The second design would be a smaller version of the proposed semi-detached building that would be located some 10 meters from Orbegail and would be 2,000 square feet per side. In order to provide additional living space, perhaps the contractor could put a, a finished basement in the plan, or even we could even consider maybe a third story if that's possible, at least a partial floor in the third story, a third story. In the January 3rd community meeting with the developer and his agent, it was clear that the community's concerns over the design and location of the structure were of no real interest to them. The agent has since claimed that they were, are willing to cut the window area on the north and south sides of the building by 1%. This small concession is in, uh, well, it doesn't offer anything to the neighbors really because it doesn't affect the size of the, of the, of the construction. Not having much thought uh, um, for the people next door is one thing, but not being concerned about their home buyers is another. For example, the front side of the building faces east, making the 20 story Azure apartment building <clears throat> the main view on that side. Also, the uh, 88 or uh, Orvigale is a prime view from the Azure complex. With the small area provided by a six meter setback, there is virtually no room for the planting of a decent sized tree to provide some screening. Also, the six meter uh, setback also limits the vehicle, vehicular parking due to the short driveways of these semis. According to the plan, two vehicles can be accommodated on each side. Some folks have two cars. Unlike wider streets, there's no street parking available in Orbigale. Where do visitors park? Duchenne Street, perhaps? Uh, a good walk away, especially in wintertime. Four extra meters of setback would provide enough space for a third vehicle and room for trees and thus yield happier homeowners. In summary, our community welcomes development, but in a scale that improves the neighborhood, poor overall design does nothing to increase the enjoyment of living in the area. With this in mind, we would greatly appreciate the assistance of your committee to help us maintain the character of this lovely part of town. Thank you for your attention to my comments. Thank you, Mr. Grosner. Is the is, is Ms. Ms. Bacula the planner on this file, I believe? Or is it Mr. Hamilton? That is myself, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, you've heard the comments from the neighbors regarding the <clears throat> setback of the house in the street. My understanding that it's that, that setback of the house had to had to be the average of the houses on either side. Correct. For, for homes in the urban area, they can use the average of the two abutting properties. There is an exception to this that where the average is greater than what is required under the underlying zone, the property is able to use the zoning front yard setback requirement. Uh, the provision is intended to match houses where they are closer to the street. So that's why there's no, <clears throat> no longer a, a, variance, a variance for, for, for front yard setback. That is correct. So they've used the, uh, they've employed the exception. Yes. Okay. And that was at the, uh, at the suggestion of the planning department? 
Uh, I believe it was initially brought forward by the applicant and the planning department has confirmed it and we do agree. Okay. All right. I just wanted to <clears throat> make that clear. Mr. Jalkotzi, very briefly, please respond to the neighbors. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you put uh, Carolyn Johnson's slide presentation up, please? Coordinator? Thank you. I think, um, go ahead to the next slide. I'll stop you in. So um, this is uh, a really, uh, actually, that's the slide. Thank you. Um, so what's missing here a little bit is uh, what's happening over on Poole Avenue. So just so people are aware, uh, the committee is aware that uh, the houses were actually facing Poole Avenue, and this was a backyard, as, as she expressed. But next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Oh. Okay, there were some lines on there, the blue lines. Um, showing the various homes and their uh, setbacks. You'll note that the three houses on the west, uh, east side of the property don't have blue lines. Um, they all, those three houses are five meters approximately from their front yard setback, which is actually less than. So the entire east side of the street um, has that uh, function. The two homes that you see on the bottom of the screen are on the south side. Um, that uh, lot line setback was not done for the purposes of making sure the houses were set back. That lot line setback was to ensure that there would be a turnaround space, cul-de-sac, on that property. And so their front yards are set back the six meters as required under the zoning bylaw as well. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Just keep going. Stop here, please. Thank you. Um, if you're looking at this view, you'll note that the view of the street is not down the middle of the street. Um, it's angled over to the west side. If you took a straight view down the street, um, you would see that the homes on the east side of the street um, would match up uh, completely with my client's proposed building. So out of the, all of the properties on the street, we have a total of two properties adjacent to my client's property who are set back and we know the reasons why it is abnormal. It is kind of unique, but on the uh, east side of the street, all of the homes are as close or closer to the property line than my client's proposed home. So the predominant pattern in this neighborhood is not the big large uh, yard on this side, which happens to be this side, and for reasons that we've already spoken about because they were developed um, with front yards actually on pool originally and backyards on this laneway. So that's not the predominant. Next slide, please. Uh, keep going. Next slide. Yeah, okay. Um, again, uh, what we're seeing here is we're seeing a complete absence of the uh, east side of the street. Uh, the streetscape is not being well represented, in my opinion. Um, and the last thing I want to uh, mention about uh, uh, safety uh, and the older buildings in this neighborhood and the uniqueness of this neighborhood. Um, 
Yes, it is an absolutely unique neighborhood. It, it however, does not have any heritage status, uh, um, which would be the kind of thing that would lead us to say, okay, we need to do certain things. I believe my client has gone out of their way now to reduce the bulk of the building facing the street, uh, to increase the level of uh, side yards. Uh, in terms of the percentage uh, reduction in uh, uh, unprotected opening. Uh, yes, it is a percent, one percent reduction from eight to seven percent. But overall, that's an overall twelve percent reduction in window area. Uh, so it is a significant amount. It's reducing the window areas by um, over ten percent. Uh, so uh, compared to what is permitted. So you you have to compare apples to apples. Seven to eight. So one percent of eight is 12 percent um so all in all i believe my client has done a, a a job in terms of trying to listen the best way that we could to the community and again uh, i learned a lot uh, and that's why the things that we put in place from our original application were put in place because we do believe that uh, we needed more room for snow we needed more room for green space and we needed to reduce the bulk of the building facing the street uh, so we we didn't disagree with that. Um, we increased the side yards from 1.2 meters to 1.5, but that was in our original application already. So that's, uh, uh, I, I think uh, my client has gone a long way to ensuring that uh, whatever uh, effect this will have on the properties will be minimized and that compared to a single family home that's permitted as a right straight to building permit, um, uh, actually provides a benefit uh, in terms of a reduced massing uh, that uh, could occur on the street. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jilikazi. Ms. Glass, we're done with the public presentations. We are uh, at the point where we're going to have to make a decision on this, and I think it's best if we, what, what we have heard, if the, uh, if the panel reserves on this application. And uh, our decision will be available in 10 days. Thanks to everyone for your uh, for your uh, presentations and uh, we'll have our decision in a week or so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Okay. Next application on the agenda are items 20 and 21, 364 Lanark, 264 Royal Avenue. Um, these, these applications were adjourned December the 8th, 2021 and January 12th. Um, it's a consent to subdivide the property to two separate parcels of land for the construction of a semi-detached dwelling of one unit on each of the newly created lots. The existing detached dwellings to be demolished by variances have been requested to reduce lot areas. <clears throat> There's revised plans filed on the 26th of January this year. And it's uh, the building has been redesigned in an effort to protect municipal trees. They've also incorporated the planning department's comments regarding front entrance and garage into this version of the design. The redesigned building should address all the previous municipal comments. Uh, no amendments to the public notice were required. So, um, Mr. West again from uh, Novatech. Let's go very quickly through the oath of solemn declaration. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the notice provided to you as part of the application process and by the committee was posted at the property to which the application applies for the prescribed number of days before the hearing and clearly visible and legi legible during the entirety of that time? I do swear. Okay, so this is the third round, I think, with us on this application. I've unfortunately lost count, but hopefully the final. <laughs> and everything, Everything has been resolved. Yeah, we, we've made a, a number of changes to the proposed development based off of comments we've received from municipal forestry staff, as well as some of the comments we've received from municipal planning staff. Okay. So the department is now content with this, with this application? 
We have no further concerns. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And you're content with it. <laughs> All right. Any questions from the panel regarding this application? Okay. Uh, Mr. Rust, you are aware of the uh, of the conditions, cash in lieu, existing dwelling removed, servicing plan, graining and drainage plan, asphalt overlay, con uh, convey corner site triangle at Lanark and Royal, a joint use and maintenance agreement, <clears throat> and a notice on title of noise due the nearby LRT. Yeah, we're aware and we're and we're fine with all the conditions listed. When, when it runs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> boy, oh boy. I am telling you. Okay, comments from the from the committee on this application. All in favor of granting the application as amended, amended, and amended. Your application is granted. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chair. Have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Now we'll return to item 17. Uh, we we stepped this down because. Uh, who was it? Mr. Blanchard did not have uh, audio access to our um, to the hearing. Is he online now? No. Nope. Still can't hear you, Mr. Blanchard. Sorry. No. Uh, Mr. Blanchard, could you try calling in? Here's the phone. The numbers on the uh, the numbers on the notice you received from the committee. Please turn off your microphone, sir. Yeah. Do we have sound? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Are we good? Yep. Can hear you now. You can hear me now? Yep. Please proceed with your presentation. Your comments. Okay. First, I'd like to apologize for my technical difficulties. And, uh, my name is Richard Blanchard. I'm at I'm at 1367 Maxim Street. Yeah. And good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'd like to thank you all for coming back and bearing with me in my technical trivials here. As previously outlined in writing to the committee, we've expressed concerns regarding the proposed development of 1371 Maxim Street, which is adjacent to our property on the south side. We purchased the property at 1367 Maxim Street in 2005 as a single family bungalow style home with a good sized private backyard. The street has evolved to the north of us, including six multi unit apartment type structures containing three two bedroom units per structure. Front and rear facades retained relatively in line with existing structures. Parking has been provided in the rear of the, in the, rear of the lots. The buildings are significantly higher than our bungalow with levels of windows providing unrestricted views above the fence and into our backyard area. Privacy has been significantly reduced and diminished. 
The proposed development at 1371 Maxim does not align with the front and rear facades of our bungalow or the rest of the structures on the street. No precedent exists in the neighborhood for long semi-detached dwellings. I would respectfully suggest that this is not a good example of reasonable and gradual intensification for this neighborhood. The proposed structure is twice the length of our home and exceeds, extends eight feet beyond the front of our bungalow, 30 feet beyond the back of our bungalow. This creates an 83 foot long, 22 foot high wall blocking views and sunlight. Blocking sunlight significantly impacts the enjoyment of our kitchen greenhouse window, backyard gardens, and pool area, all which rely on the warmth of the sun to function properly for our enjoyment. Proposed parking and unit entry located at the rear of the lot further diminishes privacy in our backyard area. Proper garbage storage has been a constant and ongoing issue on both sides of our property throughout the years. Poor placement, multiple placement locations, smell, spillage, animal attraction, all detract from our property enjoyment and will be further multiplied with the additional eight proposed units at 1371 Max Inn. Street parking has become much less available over the years. Unit parking has been provided by the existing multi-unit developments to the north. However, backing out of our laneway has become a safety issue as vehicles are parked on the no parking side of the street when parking is not readily available on the allowed side of the street. 1371 Maxim proposes eight units with a combined total of 20 bedrooms and only four proposed parking spaces in the rear. This will greatly add to the already existing problem. The 1371 Maxim proposal shows a significant shift in the lot covering materials from permeable to impermeable. Currently, the lot is primarily permeable surfaces such as landscaping. I would guess 75% permeable surface area. The majority of the pros proposed lot is impermeable surface such as asphalt driveways, interlock walkways, and roofing. I would again guess a reduction to 25% permeable surface area. My main concern is the 83 foot long sloping roof draining water directly towards my older foundation wall into a less than six foot wide permeable area, increasing the potential for my basement to flood. I am also concerned with the impacts of the root system of the large pine tree in close proximity to the 1371 property and proposed building foundation. That tree is in our front yard. It is our assertion that all these factors will contribute to the difficulty of selling our property as a single family home in the future. This is a great concern to us. We suggest that proposed minor variances are desirable and will have no effect on adjacent properties as stated in the conclusion of the urban port dated November 17, 2021 is at best confusing and worrisome. We see them as devastating to the enjoyment and privacy and safety of the most significant investment in our lifetime. Allowing the variance for a lot width of 9.06 meters, whereas 10 meters is required, effectively allows a second non-conforming structure to be considered on the lot, doubling the overall impact on the adjacent lots and the neighborhood. Minor may not be such a good choice of words describing this variance request. Thank you for listening to our concerns today. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. All right, I believe that that is the, yeah, that's the last public presentation. Mr. Hume, would you like to respond to these two gentlemen, please? If you have any comments. I, I think Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, I can offer um, a couple of uh, uh, comments. The R2 end zone permits long semi-detached uh, dwellings. So it's permitted within, uh, the zoning dialogue. We're not seeking to add a use uh, that doesn't already uh, exist. And we're certainly not uh, seeking to vary any of the parking requirements. Um, very consistent with 
um, the intent of, uh, of the official plan. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know what um, we can, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna operate this um, in uh, consistent with, you know, the, the appropriate practices for uh, developments of, of this um, scope that happen in other parts of the, uh, the city. This is very close to public transit. Um, the official plan is uh, supporting, uh, very supportive of uh, this type of uh, direction. So uh, although we respect their, their opinions, um, the, the planning um, evidence and the planning rationale lead us in uh, another direction, unfortunately. But we're willing to work with them to um, talk about landscaping and, and fencing. And when we get down to things like um, grading and drainage plans, which we will be doing, we we're more than willing to share those with our, our neighbor so that we can, um, so that he can understand about how our uh, development will or will not, uh, and I would suggest will not affect, um, you know, things like um, roof drainage and, uh, and those type of, of activities uh, will not affect negatively affect his properties. You're not allowed to drain your <clears throat> drain your roof on your neighbor anyway. Right. Uh, Mr. Hume, is there yeah. any any intention? Uh, I don't know if there'll be a designated substance report generated because of this application or not. But is there any intention to share that with the neighbors? We're happy to share um, any of the documentation that we have that we will be submitting to the the city. Um, we haven't done a designated substances report because we haven't applied for. Um, a demolition permit um, as of yet, but we're happy to share all of those documentation with- I'm just, um, I'm just looking at this as a, an older an older bungalow like this, it could very easily be uh, things like asbestos and and or uh, area formaldehyde foam. Right. In the building. So, yeah, we're, we're more than happy to, to share those type of uh, documentation with our neighbors. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wilder, you had a comment. You're Wilder, sorry. Thank you for correcting the last name, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> the, other, the other one's in Palm Springs. <laughs> um, Mr. Hume, uh, I assume you're likely going to be installing a, an eave trough system around the roof edge of this building. Is that is that your plan? Well, we're, we're not there yet, but um, in terms of providing the grading, grading and drainage. And we haven't um, taken the, the step to provide um, building permit drawings, but yes, that would be the general intent. Traditionally, these have east trough and um, we have to demonstrate through the uh, drainage plan, how we're going to collect that water and how we're going to drain it. So, so um, it would be most likely uh, that you would have these and you would direct away from the buildings uh, towards either the front or the back of the property, wherever the, the, the property library is occurring. That's correct. Okay. Um, in your early stages of development of your plans, from Mr. Hume, did you... Your sound's breaking up, Mr. Wildman. Is that better? Any better? So still a bit garbled. Oh, now. That's fine. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, in your in your early stages, um, Mr. Hume, when you were doing your plans, did did you contemplate not requiring a the minor variances and just building the units that are being proposed within the confines of the zoning requirements, would that actually fit? Did you look at that? Yes, in fact, and we, we, looked, we took a very serious look at, um, at that, not requiring the rear yard variances, um, but what they, um, and so when we looked at it, um, we, uh, and we had, we had viable, we had viable units and viable, um, secondary dwelling units. Um, they weren't really, um, 
we looked at the official plan and we looked at uh, the context of the surrounding community and we wanted larger units to attract um, you know, families. We wanted, we wanted these to be family units and the direction of the official plan was to try and provide larger units. So that's why we, uh, we went, we, we proposed uh, the variances. We have a huge rear yard and what we thought was it's better to um, it's better to have uh, larger units than than smaller units. And I should say the difference is you know 1.9 meters. So that's the difference between sort of one bedrooms in in our secondary dwelling units and and two bedrooms. And we believe that two bedroom units were more in keeping with what the official plan uh, is looking for in neighborhoods like this. Okay, so it, it is conceivable that you could comply with the zoning bylaw and still wind up with essentially the same thing. Absolutely, yes. Right, because it would be permitted if, if you didn't require any minor variances. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other comments from the, uh, from the panel regarding this application? Questions, no? Um, I, mean, I think with uh, what we've what we've heard from the neighbors and heard from Mr. Hume, I think we'll reserve on this application as well, and uh, you'll hear from us in in ten days. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your input. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the panel. Okay. With that, that concludes the.